Hey guys, welcome back to the channel. This is a story about what if Naruto brother of Mito Uzumaki. Before I start, please support for more amazing content and do consider subscribing to my channel and share this video with your friends. This is written by Mangolgo link in the description and support writer. Let's start the video. Chapter 1. Beginnings. A long time ago, as mankind struggled to master its savage nature, a titanic struggle occurred between three powerful beings. Twin brothers, imbued with the power of the gods themselves, fought to free the world from the madness and tyranny of their corrupted mother. The battle was terrible to behold, and the world was scarred permanently. Unable to bring themselves to kill the woman who birthed them, the brothers sealed their mother into the moon. One younger brother volunteered to stay on the moon to ensure the seal would remain unbroken. The elder brother returned to earth to pass on his teachings. The twins understood peace was the result of compromise, understanding, and love. Above all else it was not something that can be dictated to or imposed on their fellow humans. Humanity needed to come to terms with itself in order to reach that ideal, and the brothers knew that they would not live to see the fruits of their labor. Time passed, and mankind multiplied throughout the lands. Though he possessed unimaginable power, the elder brother slowly succumbed to mortality. He foresaw the power struggle which will most assuredly flow in the wake of his passing, and embarked on an audacious plan. Utilizing all of the knowledge at his command, he divided his power into nine separate wells of power and fashioned them after mythical beasts. He commanded them to disperse into the world of man with the promise that they would all meet again one day in an indeterminate future. Weakened by the effort, the brother's physical body quickly faded and he passed from this world. Without his guidance, jealousy and resentment slowly poisoned his descendants and violence followed. In the decades and centuries that followed, the peace that the brothers had fought so hard and sacrificed so much for crumbled and mankind forsook the plowshare for the sword. This made at the petty strife that tore about nations and families, the tailed beasts followed their creator's bidding and dispersed into the human world. Some hid themselves in the untouched wilderness of the world and became lost in time. Others settled down in remote locations and were worshipped as deities by superstitious humans. Some were captured and turned into living weapons. The most powerful one of them all, the Nine Tails, was the one most dedicated to his creator's dream of peace. He prized knowledge and wisdom above all else as he believed, much like his creator, that peace would only come once everyone understood and accepted each other. Hirama opened his eyes and narrowed them. It had been a long time since he had dreamed of the creator and his brothers. Kurama stretched his legs and yawned in the early morning light. For two centuries Kurama divided his time between the human world and the verdant bamboo forest he had come to call home. Hirama ventured out of the forest roughly every ten years or so to personally satisfy his need for contact and observe the progress the descendants had made towards peace. On his last trip to the human world over a two decade ago, he had posed as a poor youth looking to make ends meet. Kurama staked out a roadside inn located at the outskirts of the forest and did odd jobs for the innkeeper. When a trade caravan paused at the inn to spend the night Kurama persuaded the head merchant to take him on with the caravan in exchange for free labor. For nearly three years, Kurama toured all the major cities and towns in the world of humans. He sampled a thousand different delicacies and made acquaintances with as many humans. At each stop he left proxies of himself, small copies of his essence shaped in his image, who raided the local library stacks for knowledge and lurked in the bars for the latest news and gossip. But the spy network whose loyalty could not be bought and keeping him regularly informed, Kurama decided it was time to retire. Though he was amazed at the ingenuity and creativity of humans, he was also equally disappointed. The humans were capable of constructing monolithic structures that touch the skies and build ships capable of staying afloat in the roughest seas, but seemed unable to, worse yet, unwilling to, devote the same volume of effort into uplifting their less fortunate brethren. In nearly every major population center he visited, he saw desperate men, women, and children lurking in the alleyways, a population of drags that had fallen through the cracks of society and now festered in its shadows. Karama could feel the slow bubbling of resentment, ready to explode any moment. The final straw came when Kurama witnessed the corruption of his creator's gifts. When the trading caravan made a stopover in a small village, Kurama had went to fetch water for the pack animals in the nearby stream. A surge of chakra coming from the village caused him to drop the buckets and run back to the village. When he arrived, the bodies of all the villagers and the merchants were roasting in an open pit at the town center. Three bandits stood around the pit, dousing exposed flesh with a crude fire technique created with harness chakra. Kurama lost control then. He had been friends with many members of the traveling caravans and was on a first-name basis with the head merchant himself. By the time he had regained control over himself, everything within a five-kilometer radius of the village center had been turned to ash. A circular disk of broken glass now sat where the bodies were, the chakra fire burning so hotly it melted the ground itself. 
unable to reconcile how far the descendants had strayed from the path of peace, as well as ashamed of his loss of control, Karama retreated into untamed forest, receiving periodic updates from his proxies. Every so often, a proxy would return, and Karama would drink up the accumulated experiences and knowledge like a wet sponge. Within a span of a few years Karama accumulated over a thousand years of social human interaction, Karama grew wise in the ways of humans. He could tell without fail when someone was lying. He was adept at treating people's faces, a twitch of the mouth, a slightly raised eyebrow, a quickening of breath all spoke volumes about a human's intentions and motivations. Karama mastered and perfected things in a single day that took lifetimes for humans. He could prepare a feast fit for an emperor, balance a nation's budget, or perform the secret 8 trigram 64 palm technique of the Hyuga clan. Nothing could be kept secret from the fox, he learned and learned and learned. Karama trotted over to the clearing he was so fond of near the middle of the forest. The field was awash with red, white, and blue flowers dancing in the morning breeze. He found a small patch of grass and laid down before rolling on his back. It should be a while before another proxy returned and a replacement was sent out. He was content, at least for now, to watch the clouds go by. A familiar yet malevolent presence penetrated deep into the forest. Sniffing the air, Karama scanned the tree line suspiciously as the presence drew closer. Karama tasted the subtle chakra that drifted towards him. It was so very familiar to him, but yet at the same time, distant. Karama prepared for violence. The breeze blowing across the flower field died and the swing of the grass stopped. A hooded figure completely draped in black stepped out of the forest, walking hurriedly towards him. Karama stared and briefly contemplated returning to his full size to frighten the trespasser away, but adopted a wait-and-see approach towards the curious stranger. The man stopped and paces from Karama, held out his hands to show he was unarmed, and sat down with his legs crossed. Karama tilted his head quizzically. Who was this man? Despite his experiences, Karama felt unsettled. Wait and see, his inner voice urged in spite of the thickening tension. The stranger's leathery pale hands reached up from the robes and pulled the hood back. The hood gave way to a man with a pail that looked like he was in his late twenties. He had long, black hair that jutted backwards like jagged spikes. Black eyes accompanied by a small nose and a thin, false smile, rounded out the stranger's sharp, angular face. Karama did not like the man's false smile. It was the type of smile he had seen in his countless memories. It was a lie, a method to placate a victim of imminent treachery. My name is Ichihamadara, the man stated gravely, I have come to you, great demon, to seek your aid and bring about peace to my village. The Ichiha clan one of the direct inheritors of my creator. Karama's mind quickly recalled the information from most recent of his proxy. They recently helped form the first shinobi village with the Senju clan. They are led by Senju Hashirama, the Shadai Hokage, also known as the god of shinobi. Karama was very well informed. How is it they have already fallen into conflict? He asked himself. Baffled by what was asked of him, Karama asked, and how exactly do you want me to aid you? Madara responded, I need your power. I wish to use your power to defeat a man I once called my brother. When Hiroshima Senju is defeated, I will be the undisputed leader of the village. No one would dare to disturb the peace I bring. Karama shook his head, I refuse. He said flatly. So predictable, so pitiful. Madara lost the false smile he was wearing. His face reddened as shouted, why? Why do you refuse me? His promise of peace not a worthy cause. Karama stood on all fours as he readied himself to depart. This Ichiha was an echo, a reflection of the madness his creator had fought so hard to lock away. How can you call what you want peace when you impose your will on people? The peace you seek to create is a byproduct of a world without color and hope. I refuse. Madara was stunned by this response. Karama turned and started walking towards the forest depths while Madara muttered something to himself. Wait. Madara shouted. Karama looked back at the deranged man as the air grew heavy from massive killing intent. I will not be denied. Sharingan. Madara screamed. Karama stared in fascination as the whites of his Madara's eyes shifted to blood red. Before he could avert his gaze, a massive wave of unreality hit Karama. The world around him started to spin and he lost his footing. Karama stumbled and lay panting in the grass as invisible forces tugged and pulled on his mind. What what? What are you doing to me? Karama panted. He saw a shadow of a blurred form standing above his body. I will have your power demon, with or without your cooperation. Madara spat and leaned in close, your will is mine now. He whispered before breaking into an empty laugh. Never Karama whispered defiantly as he felt his consciousness getting heavier, his control weakening. That's a demon, let your true form out. Madara tossed back his head and laughed. No no Karama felt reason evaporate as his eyes glazed over. Karama was getting angry. Very angry. He needed to destroy something. Madara smiled as he watched a demon fox grew to its original size. Raw, burning red chakra radiated off the fur in waves, the very air rippling outwards with heat. 
Lumps of raw chakra rolled off the body and dripped to the ground ground. The hateful chakra withered the ground it touched and sank hissing into the soil. The small field of flowers now ablaze from the heat wave as the inferno spread outwards. Frightened birds took to the skies as the demon fox growled loudly. Tossing its head back, the fox roared with a ferocity that shook the ground while its massive tails swung and demolished the forest. But the single leap Madara landed on the demon's head. That way beast. Madara commanded. The demon sniffed in the direction that Madara pointed to and coiled its muscles. In one giant leap, the demon fox cleared the burning forest and broke into a thundering run towards Konoha. Hirama woke up and moaned. A massive headache hammered at him as he opened his eyes and surveyed his environment. He was in what appeared to be a very large study cage designed the size of a gigantic warehouse. He stared out the cage and was rewarded with silent darkness. Wherever the cage was located, it was poorly lit. Karama extended a single paw towards the gap between the bars. Before his paw reached the bars however, a series of small green glowing inscriptions materialized in the air. An invisible barrier rippled into existence just before Karama's paw reached the inscription. Karama frowned and pushed harder. The barrier yielded slightly before before Karama realized his mistake. The inscriptions, which previously glowed a neon yellow, now started flashing red. Karama watched in fascination as the small inscription extended all around the cage and crisscrossed the bars. The inscription flashed faster and faster, then completely stopped as lightning discharged inwards. Karama howled in pain as pure electricity wreathed his body. His pride wounded, Karama shrank himself down to human size and approached the bars cautiously. He moved to what appeared to be the cage door and experimentally placed his pawn on the invisible barrier again. The inscriptions appeared as they did before. Having learned his lesson the first time, Karama pulled his paw back. The inscription stayed green, then vanished after 10 seconds of inactivity. Karama narrowed his eyes and sat on his haunches. He activated the barrier seal with his paw once more, this time examining the symbols closely. The 12 symbol crystal zodiac seal with a 6 celestial guardian seal overlay. The only people talented enough to do this belongs to the Yuzumaki clan from Whirlpool Country. As if summoned by the very thought of the clan, a young woman materialized quietly in front of the cage door, she had red hair tied into buns at opposite sides of her head. Two seals hung loosely off her buns. The woman also wore a small copper crown on top of head and was dressed in a white kimono with a green undershirt. Hirama stared at her as the young woman bowed. My name is Yuzumaki Mido, second head of the Yuzumaki clan. She continued in a formal voice, wife of Senju Hashirama, Shadai Hokage of Konoha. Senju. Ah. Karama put two and two together. If you truly are of the Yuzumaki clan and wife of Hashirama, then it means Ichiha Madara did not achieve the victory he was looking for. Karama spoke evenly. Mido straightened and appraised Karama with a careful eye, if you do not remember his defeat, then does this mean you were under his control? Karama grimaced and nodded, his pride having taken one too many hits today. May I ask how I was defeated? He inquired. My husband is proficient in all five nature transformation as well as yin and yang releases, she stated proudly. But his true strength lies in his ability to combine earth and water elements to form the wood release. He was able to utilize the wood release to temporarily incapacitate you before killing Madara. Wood release this explains how the village was built so quickly. Hirama was impressed and pleased as simultaneously. Senju Hashirama was someone his creator could be proud of, not because he was talented, but because the Shadai Hokage had taken that tenuous first step towards peace by using chakra to benefit rather than dominate his fellow man. He is worthy. Karama thought to himself. Karama bowed his head in submission to a very surprised Mido. Please convey my thanks to your husband. Not only for freeing me from Madara's control, but for using chakra to benefit mankind. Mido nodded, then narrowed her eyes. I thought you would be angry at your imprisonment, she waved to the cage as she changed subjects, but you don't seem to be bothered in the least bit. Hirama snorted, I know about five different ways I can break out of this prison. All of which will either drive you insane or kill you outright. It was true. One of his previous proxies had spent four years at the Yuzumaki main clan house. Mido's face paled. Karama continued without any hint of malice, however, since I am indebted to your husband for freeing me, I swear I will not attempt to break the seal that binds me to you. I won't ask you to free me either as the answer is most likely no, and there are numerous political and military advantages in letting the world know your village possesses a Jinchuriki. I have three conditions you must meet however. Mido tensed. The fox was dangerously clever, if not brutally honest and straightforward. What are your conditions? Karama answered, the first condition is that you must lend me your senses. I want to observe your kind and see this piece of your Shadai Hokage. And before you ask, no I'm not a pervert and I'm not going to spy on your intimacy. Mido blushed. 
my second condition is for you to visit me whenever you can spare the time it has been a very long time since I have met someone I respected, Mito face reddened more, and lastly can I get a change of scenery please. I know for a fact you mortals have a good sense of imagination despite the size of your brains. Mito chuckled at the slight against her kind. I agree to your conditions. Please wait a second Mito closed her eyes. The darkness gave way to flat dirt stretching as far as the eye can see in all directions. The cage bars retracted into the ground as the bottom of the cage sank beneath the soil. Stars winked into existence as rain fell from the cloudless sky. The dirt darkened as moisture sank into the ground, the smell of water filling Kurama's nose as grass sprouted beneath him. Brow saplings sprouted from the ground and raced towards the sky. The once skinny saplings thickened into tree trunks as branches covered and shot out of the tree trunk. A series of gentle puffs filled the air as green leaves burst outwards out of the once barren trees. Mito opened her eyes. Hirama nodded his approval and curled up in the grass. Thank you, this is much more tolerable. Mito bowed and shimmered out of existence silently. True to her word, Mito visited Kurama every week to go over the latest events in the world, though he already knew most of what had occurred, given he had access to Mito's senses. Overly formal at first as befitting her station, Mito relaxed her guard around Kurama over time. Even though their conversations often devolved into a verbal sparring match, neither would admit they enjoyed their little contests. During one of the earliest conversations Kurama had with Mito, he asked her what the purpose of the shinobi was. Kurama was greatly dismayed when Mito informed him that shinobi existed as an elite mercenary military force, though he was somewhat placated by the fact that most contracts Kanoha took were either humanitarian or peacekeeping missions. Every so often there would be an assassination contract, but Kurama was soothed by the fact that almost all of those contracts were for bandit leaders and other unsavory human characters who had made the mistake of angering powerful people one too many times. Hirama was also greatly surprised to learn that shinobi were supposed to be stealthy, every shinobi he had encountered through Mito's eyes had a propensity for engaging in loud flashy attacks in broad daylight, contrary to the shinobi code Mito had explained to him before. They also shouted, shouted the names of their attacks. The worst offender to the shinobi code was predictably, Mito's excitable husband Hashirama. Mito had shrugged off Kurama's question in embarrassment and was thankful when Kurama chose not to press the issue further. The massive difference between the shinobi code and their actual behavior perplexed Kurama to no end. The years flew by. Mito aged gracefully, but she aged. Her red hair faded to brown, and her pale, smooth skin gave way to wrinkles and age spots. She was no longer capable of moving with the same grace she once had. Kurama knew the time of their separation was fast approaching, it was an inevitability he dreaded as he greatly enjoyed her company in the past decades decades. The forest in the mindscape aged much as Mito did. The lush, green leaves dried and turned into a riot of red and orange. Leaves broke off and fell to the forest floor by the dozens when the wind blew. Mito materialized into existence in the clearing. Without moving from her spot, she slowly and carefully sat down. Kurama hopped down from the branch he was perched on and trotted over. He sat down next to her rather than across from her. No words were exchanged as they stared at the falling leaves. Mito cleared her throat, it is time. She said finally. I know. Are you fine staying in the village like this? Are you all right going into another prison? Hirama shrugged. Dot, I wish to observe more. Kanoha is a place that has only gotten more interesting with time. There is a lot of potential for this place to become what my creator dreamed of. Silence. I will miss you though. Kurama admitted after a while. I will miss you too. She smiled and gently ruffled the fur on top of Kurama's head with her hand. The leaves fell in silence. Kurama's new jailer was another member of the Uzumaki clan. Kishina, a young girl with a stubborn personality and propensity for shouting, was chosen primarily for her unusually large chakra reserves, she also possessed the ability to manifest chakra chains, which can be used for both attack and defense. Hirama woke to find himself in a familiar cage, it was identical to Mido's cage before she changed the scenery. They really need to find a way to improve the seal. Kurama frowned as he shrank himself down to human size again. A prisoner would be more likely to cooperate if they were given the carrot rather than the stick. As if to summon by his complaints, Kashina popped into existence in front of the cage with a small bang. She was short and slender, with violet eyes and fiery red hair that was typical of the Uzumaki clan. She immediately started shouting, I'm not afraid of you demon fox. You're my prisoner now and you better stay on your best behavior or else. Hirama stared in silence. She had a lot of spunk, he'll give her that. He hated spunk. Kashina returned his stare and crossed her arms, well. Don't you have anything to say? Hirama turned his head and laid down facing away from her, whatever you say. He said flippantly. He felt a small surge of anger emanating from her at his blatant dismissal. You're not quite like what the others say about you. She stated after her anger receded. He chuckled, but turned to face her. She had her arms crossed and she stared into his eyes without fear. 
My reputation tends to be exaggerated. A lot of your kin tends to find convenient excuses to disasters. I don't really mind if it helps them cope with the harshness of this world, but you should know I'm not really the kind that flips mountains upside down and burning down villages. That last bit was only partially true, but Kashina didn't need to know details. She considered what he said for a minute. Sorry, I take back what I said. She offered. Apology accepted, Karama sat up again. Now he was getting somewhere. It really isn't in my nature to stir up trouble, just so you know. However, there are three things I, I need you to do for me. Kashina stayed impatiently silent. Karama laid out the same conditions he had set for Mido. Kashina nodded her head in agreement after listening to his demands, closed her eyes, and inhaled. As Kashina exhaled, the cage bars fell outwards onto the ground, while the cage ceiling flew upwards into darkness. A trickle of water flowed from Karama's left and grew into a gentle flowing stream between the two. The sky brightened into a vivid hue of orange and red, the fading light of the sinking sun reflecting off of the lazy clouds. Grass sprouted from the brown soil in all directions. Green stretched as far as Karama could see. Kashina opened her eyes. Better. She asked. Better. Karama nodded. Come visit me again sometime, kid. You might be surprised at how smart I am. He bragged. Kashina stuck her tongue out at him, see you later Mr. Fox. Karama smiled. The name is Karama Brat. He yelled as Kashina poofed out their shared space. Kashina never truly grew out of her personality. She was loud, brash, and prone to violent confrontations. She had just about the same subtlety as a crate of class 2 exploding tags. More often than not, the only solution Kashina had for her problems was an application of overwhelming force behind a closed fist. Despite his initial dislike of her, Karama gradually warmed up to her as she was unabashedly honest in everything she did and everyone she met. Things changed after her attempted kidnapping by Kumo Nins however. Karama had watched helplessly as Kashina was marched away from Kanoha and bound by specially inscribed chakra suppressing chains. He had been racking his brains for a way to temporarily nullify the imprisonment shield without harming her when a yellow flash appeared and single-handedly defeated all the enemies. Karama got a good look at Kashina's savior. He was slightly tanned man with blue eyes and golden hair held back by his forehead protector. He had a sharp face which used of confidence. The yellow flash indeed. Karama thought. It wasn't really surprising that Kashina fell head over heels for Namaki's Minato. What did surprise Karama was when Kashina approached him for help. Karama. The disturbance woke Karama out of his half-nap in between the grass. He uncurled himself from his sleeping positions and stretched. Kashina tapping her feet impatiently as he trotted over. You don't usually visit me on weekdays. Is something bothering you? He asked. It was true. She only ever visited him on Sundays. Yes. No. I mean I need your help. She looked down as her cheeks flushed. She never asked for his help before. Not ever. Karama realized she had swallowed her pride for this, so he chose not to mock her. He'll have his fun later. So what can I help you with? He asked, now more curious than anything else. Well, I need your insight she trailed off, which tells me absolutely nothing. Karama thought. But if she is dancing around the issue like this, is this about Minato? He ventured. Yes. No. I mean maybe. Karama groaned. This will take a while. Karama rolled his eyes and started trotting away, if you don't tell me exactly what you need from me, then stop wasting my time. He was halfway back to his favored napping spot when he felt her anger boil over. I need your help to get Minato. I mean, get Minato to like me. There I said it. Are you happy now she screamed at him. Her face was fast approaching the color of her hair and she was breathing heavily from yelling. Karama turned and trotted back. He sat down on his haunches facing her. Yes. He said with a smirk. A large wave of unrefined killing intent spilled out of Kashina and hit like a sledgehammer Karama, a uh, Kashina? He asked nervously. Kashina's violet eyes disappeared behind a white haze as her face darkened. She eased into a combat stance as her feet spread apart and she hunched over slightly. Her hands dropped down to her side and she clenched them into fists. Is this a new bloodline development? Karama asked himself. The hair that Kashina normally wore down took on a life of its own and rose and bobbed behind her independently of each other. Chakra chains emerged behind her and reached up and to her side. The sharp stakes bobbed up and down as they oriented themselves at Karama. Faint traces of blood trickled between her fingers, a testament to how hard she was clenching her fingers. The normally lazy afternoon sunset Karama had grown fond of darkened as clouds swallowed up the sky. Lightning struck and cratered the landscape. Wisps of white smoke rose from the soil and congealed into arms, pulling Karama into the ground as the soil shifted into faces contorted in agony and howled. Karama panicked. He spoke quickly, trying to keep his voice even and failing badly. I am an expert on human relationships, and I know of a great many ways to attract members of the opposite sex. Karama babbled out. 
In an instant, the angry dark clouds dissolved into the air and uncovered the lazy sunset. The faces in the soil disintegrated and the arms dispersed into the grass. Oh. Is that so? I'm so glad you've decided to help me. She closed her eyes and smiled while clapping her hands together. The chakra chains retracted quickly, and her fiery red hair fell lifelessly behind her. A trickle of cold sweat ran down Karama's back. His life had flashed before his eyes. Let's start with what we know. Karama started, eager to avoid a repeat of the raw terror he had witnessed, do you know if he likes you? Ah, uh, maybe. She blushed as she twirled with one end of her hair between her hands. Karama rolled his eyes. Again. Karama with his four legs crossed together, deep in thought, if the attraction is mutual, why not start by cooking him something as a token of appreciation? I've often heard humans say the way to a man's heart is through his stomach. Ashina slowly nodded her head, that's not a bad idea. What should I make for him? She asked. What does he like? Do I really need to ask this? Is she dumber than I thought? I don't know actually Kashina frowned. Why not bake some brownies then? You humans seem to have quite the fondness for sweet treats. Karama suggested. You really think he will like brownies? She was warming to the idea. I'm sure he will like it since you made it for him. Karama encouraged. Great. Thanks for your help Karama. She puffed out of existence so quickly Karama didn't even have a chance to respond. Maybe I should have asked if knows how to cook. Karama pondered. Well, it's just brownies. How bad can it be? Ashina Yuzumaki stomped down the street. People scrambled and gave her a wide berth. They knew that look. Someone or something was going to be ended soon. The brownies had been a disaster. It's not my fault that you set your kitchen on fire. Karama whined inside. I didn't know it was possible to set cocoa powder on fire. Ashina was in the middle of snarling a retort when she collided with something and fell back on her butt. Hey. Watch where you're going. She shouted as she rubbed her bottom. I'm sorry. But you were the one that invited me over you know. A familiar voice said. Kashina looked up to see a smiling Minato offering her his hand. Kashina blushed, her anger all but forgotten. She took Minato's offered hand and hauled herself upright. So, what are you doing out here? Minato asked. I am hungry. Let's go get dinner, it will be my treat. Kashina said hurriedly as she grabbed Minato's arm and started dragging him away. Minato turned his head back and squinted in down the street in the direction Kashina came from. Is there a fire in your apartment building? Shouldn't we go back and check it out first? He asked. It's nothing don't worry about it. She huffed as several firemen ran past them with buckets of water. The dinner was a catastrophe. No one was quite sure what had happened. Everything was fine one minute and the next a massive explosion rocked the market district. A massive inferno consumed the restaurant as the district descended into pandemonium. Firefighters battled the blaze for six whole hours before the fire was contained. The Nohe General Hospital was filled to capacity with shell shock survivors and walked wounded, the scene reminiscent of the darkest days of the Second Shinobi War. The local police station received two new patrons that night. Minato sat one cell, shocked to silence. He had been charged with disturbing the peace. Ashina sat with her head lowered shame in the adjacent cell. She is charged with multiple counts of disturbing the peace and aggravated assault. She also needed to pay a fine for headbutting one of the dogs belonging to the Inuzuka clan that had been out for a walk. After an hour passed, Minato managed, well, you certainly know how to show me a good time. Ashina's head lowered further in shame, while Karama roared with laughter on the grass in the mindscape. A gentle earthquake in the mindscape startled Karama awake. That's different. He thought. Worried, Karama accessed the shared senses. Her eyes were closed, but Karama could hear heavy breathing. Karama kept their link open until Kashina opened her eyes. He caught a flash of a familiar golden hair in her vision. Ah. Good for her. Karama cut the shared senses immediately and curled back up, though he had difficulties going back to sleep due to the rolling earthquakes. When Kashina came to visit that Sunday, she found Karama waiting for her with a smirk. She felt an overwhelming urge to punch that smile off his face. It appears our little Kanoichi is now all grown up. Karama said in sadness. He brushed away an exaggerated tear from his eyes with his paw. Kashina turned bright red. You, you saw. She stammered. Karama laughed, just enough to see what was happening. His face turned serious, I've been thinking it's time that Minato changed his nickname to something more appropriate. And what, may I ask, should his new nickname be? Kashina asked suspiciously, fully unaware of the, the trap Karama was luring her into. He should change his name to Yellow Flasher. Karama shouted and roared with laughter at his juvenile joke. Karama felt searing pain across his entire body as he was lifted into the air by Kashina's uppercut. He flew back a hundred meters and landed with a thud. Karama yowled as chakra chains rained down from the sky and dug deep into his tails. Karama looked up in pain, but Kashina was already gone. Worth it. Karama thought in between bouts of pain. Maybe I should have told her she's pregnant. 
nah, Hirama limited his presence during the final stages of Kashina's pregnancy. The seal, though powerful enough to hold a tailed beast, was also at its weakest, as the mother carried a new life inside her. He was caught completely unaware when the mindscape started shaking violently. Kashina? He asked. Airline fractures splintered across the afternoon sky. The earth beneath Kurama shook violently as random bits of soil pushed up from the ground. Kashina? The sky shattered outwards into a million fragments and gave way to darkness. The ground beneath Kurama gave way and vanished. Kurama fell screaming into the black abyss. Kurama woke once again. This really needs to stop happening. He breathed in deeply. This is real. He thought. He could feel the coolness of the evening air and the soft grass he was lying on. He was in the real world. Kurama opened his eyes. Kashina laid in front of him on the ground. She was alive, but weak. Next to her stood a man with short black hair and a black cloak. The man's face was completely covered with an orange mask, a swirling pattern ending in a single dark hole where the eye should be. The man turned and looked up at Kurama as if appraising him. Kurama took this brief pause to create a much-needed lifeline. Pure chakra dripped out of the tail closest to the ground. The chakra droplets hit the ground and bounced. At the apex of the bounce, the droplets shifted into the form of small foxes and darted into the woods. Kurama could feel his proxies splitting a few more times as they raced away into the night. As Kurama felt the last of the proxies fade in the distance, the man with the orange mask appear suddenly on top of his nose. A displacement technique. Kurama thought as he focused on the hole on the man's mask. The eye behind the hole glowed red. Sharingan. Not again Kurama cursed himself as he felt his consciousness fading. In the depths of the forest, a great demon fox wreathed in chakra fire, raised its head in the moonlight, and let out a terrifying roar. The losses had been terrible. The demon fox had torn straight through all three of the hastily assembled defensive lines. Weaker shinobi had been frozen or killed outright by the massive killing intent that pulsed out of the nine tails. Shinobi died by the dozens as the fox clawed at their hiding places and leveled entire sections of the forest. The demon had shrugged off their strongest explosive tags and kunai without slowing down. Each swipe of nine tails fell trees and cratered the land. Just as the demon was about to tear down the northern section of the village wall, the Yandame had arrived on top of Gamabunta. The first of the Toad clan struggled against the demon fox and was able to temporarily subdue him before Minato had teleported the fox away. Garizan Saratobi had initially questioned the effectiveness of the tactic, as the fox can simply make its way back to Kanoha, and Gamabunta was no match for the beast in a drawn-out fight. He now understood the terrible meaning behind his successor's desperate action. Saratobi in full battle guy was still counting the losses in his head when he and his Anbu escorts arrived at the massive clearing. They stared. Minato Namikas and Kashina Yuzumaki lay lifeless in a bloodied embrace on the ground before him, their eyes closed and their face caked with dirt and marred by dried tears. A rough stone altar occupied the center of the clearing. Oh Minato had you only told me what you planned to do. The soft sound of a baby's wail snapped Saratobi out of his thoughts. He ran to the stone altar and gasped. On the altar was a wailing newborn with golden blonde hair. Kashina Saratobi choked back his tears as he realized the full extent of Minato and Kashina's sacrifice. He scooped up the baby, blanket and all, into his arms and rocked the baby gently. Dog, informed the Inuzuka tracking teams we have found the Yandame and Kashina Yuzumaki, Saratobi ordered, have them divert to Sector 112 to locate the Yandame's escorts. When the escorts are found, have the investigation teams perform a full analysis before moving the bodies. When you have the results, report directly to me. The silver-haired Anbu nodded. Pat, contact Shikaku Nara in the command center and have them dispatch a recovery team here. Tell him to prepare the post-battle damage assessment as well as a list of our casualties, inform the advisors of what has happened and send a message to the civilian council. Tell them tell them I am temporarily in charge until a suitable hokage replacement can be found. The purple-haired Anbu dipped her head in acknowledgement, nodding his head in dismissal, the two Anbu vanished in a swirl of leaves. Saratobi sighed and looked down at the sniffling baby. Hirama stirred from his hazy nightmare and winced as massive pain echoed in his mind. He could sense that he was locked away again. If I'm locked away, that means the masked man's plan failed. I'm sure Kashina made it out fine though, she's a tough one. Karama comforted himself. Karama was never very good at fooling himself, so he chose to file away the sad thoughts. Karama sat up and took in his surroundings. Wonderful. He thought as he stared past the bars of his cage and into the darkness. At least they added something new this time. Water pooled around his legs as he shrank himself down to a more manageable form. Kurama examined his the inscriptions on his cage as he pressed one of his paws against the bar. A trigram seal. He stated to no one in particular. Though it's not as strong as it can be, I can feel my chakra leaking out of the cage, perhaps whoever sealed me didn't have enough time to properly perform the seal. Kurama pondered for a second. No, this was done intentionally. 
Whoever sealed me in here wanted my jailer to have access to my chakra Karama concluded. He had a pretty good idea of who his new jailer was, the most obvious choice would have been in Yuzumaki, and given that the current mindscape was not the one he shared with Kashina, it meant he was sealed in the closest available Yuzumaki candidate. The Yuzumaki with Namika's blood. Hirama sighed at the desperation and anguish the parents must have felt as they sacrificed their baby to contain him. He decided then and there he was going to do everything in his power to help this child. He owed it to Kashina. It's not as if I was doing anything more meaningful anyway. Karama reasoned. As he laid back down, Karama noticed a mote of light dancing frantically just outside the cage. Karama squinted at the mote and could feel pure terror radiating from it. Karama stretched out his tails and pushed against the seal. The seal strained but gave way just slightly. He gathered the mote of light in his slightly diminished tails and rocked it gently. He hummed a gently lullaby, a song he recalled from Mito's time as a mother. The moat settled down, growing stronger and brighter as the feeling of terror receded. Hirama poured images of a smiling Kishina and Minato, as well as the feeling of warmth and comfort into the moat. The moat glowed intensely while radiating warmth in response. The moat flashed once, twice, and then disappeared for good. Hirama retracted his tails and laid down. Though alone again, he closed his eyes and smiled. Tsuritobi leapt from tree to tree as he made his way back to Konoha. He had been dreading the damage report so much he barely noticed the baby had stopped crying. Worried, Saratobi stopped at the next branch, and Saratobi gently pulled back the blue blanket covering the baby's face. He noticed for the first time the whisker marks which adorned the baby's face. Two large blue saucers stared back at him and cooed happily. Saratobi smiled at the baby, it is nice to meet you Naruto. Chapter 2. The reason you are hated. A disheveled barefooted four-year-old Naruto stepped out an unlit alleyway underneath a moonless sky. His dark green sandals were gone, dirt caked his pants and forearms, and his right pant leg was torn from the knee down. His trademark white shirt with a red fire spiral reeked of alcohol and sweat, his left shoulder ached slightly from where the wine bottle had struck him. Naruto stopped briefly to calm the pounding in his heart, but a faint echo in the breeze drove him forward. He backed away from the echo, turned, and hurriedly limped in the opposite direction. He did not notice the various mansions and estates behind the white walls, running down the length of the street on both sides. Stone lanterns dimly illuminated the streets as Naruto shuffled along. A man rounded the corner far behind Naruto, squinted at him, and started pointing and yelling. Two more appeared, then five, then a whole crowd of drunken, angry men and women bent on violence. Naruto threw a frightened glance behind him as he kept limping away, his terror overriding the pain in his right ankle. An inner voice urged him on. Hurry. Faster. Naruto had made a terrible mistake, his eyes widened as the street abruptly ended in white stone steps leading up to a solid grey wall, with a set of rounded red doors. Two torches hung on either sides of the door, each illuminating imposing stone statues twice the height of a normal man. The statues depicted monkey warriors within full shinobi armor in combat stances. The monkey warrior on the left held two axes, one in an outstretched arm at an angle, while the other was held above and behind the main body of the statue. The statue leaned backwards, the left leg stretched forward angle towards the ground, while the right leg was turned away in a crouch. The one the right held a thick staff in its right hand slightly raised behind its hips, while an outstretched left arm ended in an open arm. This statue was standing on its right leg, the left leg was folded against the main body. With no other choices available to him, Naruto limped up the steps and lurched towards the red doors. There was a wooden plaque with red letters set in a gold engraving mounted above the doors. He recognized one of the large golden character inscribed on the left door. Monkey. Naruto was too short for the rounded bronze door knockers, so he began shouting as loud as he could while pounding the door with his tiny fists. The crowd drew closer, their shouting and jeering filling the air. Demon. They chanted as rotten vegetables and makeshift missiles flew out at Naruto. Naruto ceased his pounding. He was out of steam. He sank to his knees and sobbed as the crowd stalked up the stone steps. Enough. A deep voice that seemed to come from everywhere at once shocked the mob to silence. The trees lining the street swayed from the raw power behind the voice. The confused crowd looked at each other and searched their surroundings to find the source. A few of the more observant members of the crowd spied the inscribed characters and started to back away slowly. The crowd froze as the heavy wooden doors creaked open backwards. A set of hands marred by age and battle swooped down and supported Naruto as he pitched forwards. Naruto struggled lightly as powerful, protective arms gathered him up. Naruto looked up and ceased struggling. He knew this person. Naruto whispered weakly, Jiji. Tsuritobi looked down and nodded. He smiled at Naruto, his rage hidden behind a mask. SHH, it's okay now. You're safe. Naruto's world dimmed to blackness. October 10th was just another typical day at the orphanage located at the outskirts Konoha. The orphanage was a simple wooden affair, it was a long rectangular building two stories tall with a gently sloping roof covered by the traditional blue ceramic tiles. 
a slightly taller clocker tower was attached to the front end of the building. The main floor consisted of a simple reception area by the main entrance, visitors' lounge for prospective parents, a large kitchen, a nursery, a dining hall that doubled as an assembly area, and also numerous classrooms and playrooms. All of the rooms featured large rectangular windows which allowed sunlight to our in. The second story was slightly smaller, but still packed with enough rooms and bed for at least a hundred's children and the necessary caretakers. The orphanage had been founded by a kindly medical nin after the Second Shinobi War. Back then, the orphanage was constantly over capacity, and the orphans often had to share rooms. Now however, less than a quarter of the rooms were occupied. There had been a sudden influx of orphans after the demon fox attacked four years ago true, but most of the children had been adopted out by surrounding townsfolk and distant relatives. Only one child was never considered for adoption. Naruto was four now, according to the orphanage's records. Not only was he the oldest orphan, he was also the orphan who had stayed the longest. Naruto had made many friends initially, but one by one they were adopted out, and he lost contact with them. Though he held on to the faint hope he would have family one day, he always felt the accusatory looks visitors gave him whenever he was seen. After a while Naruto simply gave up and spent most of his free time by himself exploring the surrounding forests or daydreaming on top of the roof. The caretakers knew his secret, courtesy of the gossips in the civilian council who controlled their funding. The head caretaker himself was well aware of the council's petty vindictiveness and only acquiesced to their secret demands for Naruto in exchange for more funding. Knowing that no one would ever adopt Naruto to the existing prejudice, the caretakers sought to improve Naruto's stock for the recruitment teachers from the Shinobi Academy. The caretakers punished Naruto for the smallest infraction according to the wishes of the council by making him do chakra molding exercises. They encouraged Naruto to run and play alone in the forests to build his stamina, though he was always secretly watched from on high by a retired Jown and now turned caretaker. The only constant in Naruto's life aside from the caretakers was the kindly old man with the funny hat who visited the orphanage every so often. Naruto wasn't blind to the fact Siratobi paid more attention to him during his short visits than the other orphans. Every time the old man visited he doled out candy and confections generously to the excited children, but he would always save a little something extra for Naruto. Naruto had woken up fairly early today. After eating breakfast alone in the dining room, one of the caretakers had dragged him off to do chakra molding exercises. Though he failed for three days when the lesson was first taught to him, Naruto had kept it to practice religiously it until it became natural. After lunch, the caretaker had dismissed Naruto and allowed him to wander around the forest alone. Naruto had spent an hour swimming in a pond he had found on a previous excursion and spent the rest of his time chasing rabbits and other small woodland creatures. By the time Naruto returned and washed up, he was completely exhausted. He shoved dinner into his mouth quickly in the dining room and dove into soft embrace of his bed before the sun had completely set. Hours later a muted thump pulled Naruto out of his dream. Naruto yawned as he sat up and stretched his arms into the air. Thump. Curious, Naruto swung his feet off the bed and stood up. He crept towards his window, keeping his ear alert for the source of the noise. Thump. Thump thump. The fresh evening air flowed into his room as Naruto threw open the window and looked towards the source of the noise. He was dazzled by the light show before him. Off in the distance, multiple missiles screamed in the air as they arsed towards the black evening sky. At the peak of their arc, the missiles exploded into a million multicolored pieces that fell back towards the earth. It's so pretty. Naruto gaped. His curiosity peaked, Naruto quickly changed out of his pajamas and slid into his white shirt and orange track pants. After tightening the straps on his sandals, he pulled himself up over the window edge and onto the roof. He scrambled quietly across the blue clay tiles against the second story wall and made his way towards back of the building. Naruto wrapped his body around the small metal drainage pipe and slid down quietly, careful to not attract any attention. He crouched low as he hit the ground and stayed silent, listening for any signs of discovery. After a brief pause, Naruto grinned and sprinted out across the open yard. He ran towards the source of the spectacle, his nervousness all but forgotten at the prospect of something new and exciting. Naruto could scarcely believe his eyes. In front of him past the lines of bushes he hid in was the largest collection of people he had seen his entire life. The festival was a relatively new event that came to existence a year after the great demon fox was defeated. Originally marked as a memorial event for the shinobis who gave their lives valiantly in defense of the village, the day was appropriated by greedy villagers who had hoped to capitalize on the event and turn a quick profit. They were successful beyond their wildest dreams. Subsequent festivals grew louder and gaudier, with more and more people showing up to enjoy the spectacle. The event itself was located in the village center, a circular, stone-paved area with multiple streets intersecting and branching off from it. Trees and bushes lined the outer perimeter of the circle, while stings of paper lanterns hung from one wooden post to the next and brought light to the moonless night. 
the centerpiece of the festival was an effigy of the demon fox hanging from a large wooden pole with a rope tied around its neck in the middle of the village center. The effigy itself was crudely made, it was a series of sacks stuffed with dried leaves and compost, stitched together with the all the skill of an underworld surgeon, and hung by the neck over a large pit. A poorly drawn face with a comically sad frown adorned the head of the effigy. Were it not for the fact there were nine long sacks stitched to the torso, one would have been hard-pressed to identify the exact source of inspiration. Upon seeing the crude effigy, a wave of amusement washed out from inside Naruto. Multi-colored stalls surrounded the stood next to the trees and lined the streets. The stalls had everything from freshly grilled meats and fish, rigged games with large printed signs that read No Chakra, to deter any shinobi from clearing out the stock, to peddlers that sold sparklers, animal masks, and assorted decorative trinkets. Naruto's own stomach growled as the aroma of grilled chicken reached his nostrils. He licked his lips and looked on hungrily. Naruto stared at the festival goers and studied them. There were people of all shapes and sizes. Some were tall and skinny, some short and fat. Most had black or brown hair, though one particular female had pink hair pinned up with a golden headpiece. Some wore traditional kimonos as well as multicolored yukatas, others wore denim shorts and t-shirts. The people he saw held on to each other, laughed themselves silly, and shouted with excitement at impossible games of chance. Naruto's throat tightened, despite the festivities playing out before him, he felt as if he was the loneliest person on the planet right then and there. Why can't I have this? He asked himself. Abruptly, Naruto tore his gaze away from the crowds and stared at the sky. He could not understand why he was different, why he was hiding in the bushes instead of standing in the street like everyone with this line of thinking, Naruto pushed away his thoughts and made his decision. Giving one last look at the festival, Naruto turned to crawl away. It was time to go back to the orphanage. The booming announcement that Naruto couldn't make out silenced the festivities. He stopped and looked up. As one, the crowd was started shuffling towards the village center and the effigy. Naruto scrambled up a tree and hopped onto one of the lower branches. He wanted to see what was happening. The large balding man with tan skin and gray hair and a gold and white kimono shouted into a megaphone he held in his left hand. He held and waved a lit torch on his right hand. Naruto struggled to make out what the man as the crowd started shouting louder and louder. The crescendo of shouts reached its peak as the man lifted the torch towards the sky and stabbed the torch into effigy. The crowd cheered as the effigy was quickly consumed in a fiery embrace. The announcer bowed low amidst thunderous applause. Naruto stared in morbid fascination as the string holding the effigy snapped and the charred remnants fell into the pit and smoldered. The bold man lifted his head and smiled as his eyes swept over the crowd. Naruto froze as the man's gaze stopped and fixated on him. The man shouted something incoherent and pointed wildly in Naruto's general direction. The crowd fell silent and turned their heads to Naruto. He felt a growing unease in his gut as the entirety of village center scrutinized him, their eyes with undisguised hatred. Someone in the crowd shouted, and Naruto instinctively dodged as a rock the size of an adult fist sailed past his head. Naruto turned and hopped off the branch as the rest of the crowd started shouting. Landing smoothly on the soil he rolled forward, redirecting momentum as makeshift missiles peppered the area around him around him. Naruto scrambled through the bushes on his arms and knees, but twigs nagged his feet. He twisted around and undid his sandals in a hurry to untangle himself. Naruto dashed forward, climbing over a fence and leaving his sandals behind. As he swung his legs over a piece of wire caught his pants. Fabric tore as Naruto pulled on his legs and fell off the fence. Naruto picked himself back up and cut between some stalls before spilling out onto a side street. Naruto sprinted away from the village center the as shopkeepers pointed and yelled at him. As he ran Naruto looked back and saw that a portion of the crowd was giving chase. Though Naruto was quite swift on his legs, he was still only a small kid, the crowd soon closed the gap. Various sticks, trash, and beverage containers sailed through the air and landed around him as he weaved through the street. A half-empty bottle of sake caught him in the shoulder, spilling its contents out. Naruto gasped in pain and grabbed his shoulder as alcohol splashed across his upper torso, still he ran. As he approached a darkened intersection, a voice inside him called out. Left. The voice commanded. Naruto slowed. Go left. The voice shouted now, seemingly impatient. Naruto veered left at the intersection. Now go right. The voice nagged as Naruto approached an alley. Again Naruto obeyed. He ran full tilted down the alley even though it was completely dark. His eyes adjusted just in time to see a large pile of bag garbage appear in front of him. Naruto leaped instinctively, letting the momentum of his sprint carry him up and across the garbage. As he made contact with the ground however, his left foot slipped on wet asphalt. Naruto's put out his right leg to stabilize himself and screamed in pain as pain shot up his ankle from the poor landing. Naruto lost his balance and fell forward face first into the ground. Naruto moaned and pushed himself up against the wall using his left leg. Hurry. The voice urged. 
Wincing with pain at each step he took, Naruto stepped out of the alley. A seething Saratobi held on to Naruto as he lost consciousness. A solidly built young man with short spiky black hair and goatee wearing a chunin vest stepped out from behind Saratobi, a small trail of smoke coming from the cigarette in his mouth. He took one look at the scene before him and shook his head. The idiots. Saratobi turned to face Asuma. A blade of wind chakra cut Asuma's cigarette in half by the stem. Asuma spat out the cigarette stump and swallowed nervously. Asuma, take Naruto to the hospital and have the doctors examine him. Saratobi said gravely with a tone that left no room for argument. Asuma nodded as his the elder Saratobi handed him the blonde kid. Dog. A silver-haired Anbu materialized next to Asuma and knelt. Go with him, make sure they get to the hospital without any distractions. Saratobi commanded. Dog nodded and both man shunshin ed towards the hospital without further comment. The smile Saratobi wore for Naruto vanished now, and his mask gave way to an impassive face. This was the same expression that froze an enemy down in their paths and gave pause to fellow cages. This was the face of a stone-cold killer who knew a thousand different ways to kill an enemy without moving from where he stood. The kindly old leader who gave candy to laughing children and greeted villagers on the street was currently on a sabbatical. So, Saratobi began. His eyes swept out towards the gathered group of villagers standing in front of him. Will someone please explain to me what happened? Saratobi's voice was neutral, though a few in the crowd knew how dangerously close to violence the hulkage was. The crowd remained silent, looking nervously at one another. As it happens, the least intelligent of the lot, the fat balding oaf with a megaphone, courageously pushed his way forward to the front of the assembled crowd to challenge the old man directly. We were gonna punish that demon for ruining our fun. He yelled as he jabbed a finger at Saratobi, you let him get away from us, so I'm holding you responsible for all the damage he caused. The blood drained from the faces of the entire crowd. They could have talked their way out of this, but not anymore. Saratobi, normally accustomed to a modicum of respect, was completely unprepared for the man's audacity. He was taken aback, but only for a fraction of a second. And just how did Naruto ruin your fun? He inquired. He was there. The oaf responded loudly, as if that was somehow a sufficient explanation for everything that had happened. Can you be more specific? Saratobi pressed. He was there. The oaf screeched as Saratobi gawked at him, he was there when he shouldn't be. He was gonna ruin everything again just like he did four years ago. So I was going to put the demon down like he should have been from the very start. The man continued, the demon's only a live cause that goddamn failure of the hokage, ain't man enough to kill him, and now has dead cause of his stupidity. The crowd gasped. If there were buttons to anger Saratobi, the oaf would be slamming on all of them with a giant mallet hammer. Saratobi scanned the faces of those in the crowd. Everyone backed away from the man. What's the matter? You not man enough to look at me in the eyes. Yar just a washed up has been wiping up the failure's shit. The oaf spat. Without warning, a massive shockwave of killing intent exploded from Saratobi. The typhoon of raw power pushed the entire crowd face first onto the ground while kicking up dirt and swaying trees. Building foundations as far as the outskirts of Kanoha shook lightly, causing windows and doors to rattle in turn. Startled birds took to the night while panicked animals cried. The man who had been so loud and insulting was now in a panting heap on the ground. As Saratobi stepped towards him, the man gave out a yelp of fear and scrambled backwards on his hands and butt. What is the meaning of this? A male voice from to his right demanded. Amura, Kaharu, how good of you to show up. And I see you've brought Danzo along. Saratobi spoke deadpan without even looking in the trio's direction. Whatever you are doing, you must stop at once. This is a matter for the civilian council since it doesn't involve your shinobus. The elderly female stated. Saratobi turned his head until his gaze settled on his former teammates. Kaharu and Hamura returned his stare defiantly, while Danzo looked aloof. Six Anbu flanked the three elders, but all knelt in submission to their hokage. Is that so? Saratobi said sweetly. Well, why don't we convene the council right now then? Right now? Before Kaharu could lodge any further protests, Saratobi's left hand shot out from underneath the robes. He pointed to the crowd with his hand, then pulled his hand close his face as he bowled up his fist. The Anbu vanished from where they knelt and reappeared in a hexagonal formation around the crowd. As one, they flashed through a long series of hand signs and collapsed their hands together. Tsuro no Jutsu. Saratobi felt the air drying as the moisture was sucked towards the middle of the crowd. A small droplet of water appeared, growing steadily and swirling quicker and quicker. The water prison grew larger larger, trapping more and more of the recovering villagers. Saratobi stared as the trapped villagers struggled to hold their breath. The hare screamed, stop this at one Saratobi. Saratobi ignored her dot take them to the council chambers. He ordered. The six Anbu walked towards the Hokage Tower, each contributing to the integrity of the water prison with one arm. Saratobi turned to look at the three advisors. Kahari's face was red with anger, while Hamura shook his head in disapproval. 
Danzo remained aloof, but his face gave the smallest hint of a smirk. He always did enjoy putting the civilians in their place. Saratobi mused. I will summon the council. Hamura stated. You better hurry. I don't think those villagers can hold their breath for too long. Saratobi tossed back as he walked away. Danzo followed. Hamura and Kohorus went wide as realization hit the men ran off unceremoniously. Saratobi stood in front of his chair in the council chambers with his eyes closed. Danzo sat one chair way to his left, blissfully silent with his thoughts to himself. The Anbu stood off to the right, maintaining their water prison in silence and occasionally blowing a bubble of air into large ball of water. The council chamber was a carpeted round room furnished with a large circular oak table and almost two dozen wooden chairs. The walls and ceiling were painted in beige, while three large portraits of the previous hookages hung behind Saratobi's chair. The room was illuminated by off-white light bulbs, a fairly new invention out of lightning country that was still in evaluation stages. Across from Saratobi, a set of double doors were thrown open with a bang. Civilian councillors flooded into the room, shouting and pleading at Saratobi. The military council walked into the room casually, apparently unconcerned with the sight before them. They took seats while the councillors remained standing and continued their individual tirades. You have no right, this is a matter for the... Saratobi exhaled and opened his eyes. Sit. He commanded. The shouting continued. Sit. He stated as a massive killing intent blanketed the room. The councillors found their seats quickly, much as schoolchildren did in the face of an angry headmaster. Hamura and Kahara refused to look at Saratobi as they took their seats to the left and right of him. Good, we can get started now. Saratobi smiled without any warmth and nodded to the Anbu. The Anbu withdrew their arms and ended the jutsu. The prison collapsed violently, spilling water and villagers everywhere. Counselors jumped up and shouted in dismay as water splashed onto their onto their robes and other decorative trinkets. Saratobi repressed a grin. One of more dignified counselors spoke up. Please, Hokage-sama, what is the meaning behind this display? He asked. Saratobi spoke, as you know, today is October 10, the fourth anniversary of the Kaiubi attack. While this is certainly a cause of celebrations, a citizen of Kanoha was attacked tonight. Dead silence as shock rain gathered counselors. Who was attacked? A different counselor asked. A demon. A shout came from the crowd of shivering villagers. The fat oaf pushed his way forward again. Yeah, hey, that's right. We hurt that demon brat. We would have killed him too if it ain't for him. The man had somehow found his courage in front of the civilian counselors. Typical. Just another spoiled man-child crying to mommy. Saratobi looked around the table. The Shinobi War Council simply stared in shock at the man's audacity. A good portion of the civilian counselors shook their head in disapproval at man's impertinence and complete lack of respect, never mind he just admitted to assaulting a child, demon container or not. We should have killed him, the man was on a rant now, let him die in the streets like that good for nothing how could you call a fourth. Everyone in the room gasped. No one was stupid enough to think Kanoha could have escaped harm without the sacrifice of the yellow flash. There were those on both councils who could not recall the numerous times they have been saved by the Yande Mount on the field. Even Danzo narrowed his eye at the outrageous insults. Saratobi closed his eyes and said nothing. The man was making Saratobi's case for him. He opened his eyes to the civilian councillors whispering and nodding to each other. As the whispering ceased the councillors sat up straight and locked their gazes on Saratobi. A grey-haired representative clothed in a white kimono stood up. Okajama. He addressed Saratobi. The civilian council does not approve of any attack on a fellow Kanoha citizen citizen. We also strongly condemn this man's insults regarding the honored Yandame. As these villagers have brazenly revealed an S-class military secret, this issue is no longer under our jurisdiction. We turn these villagers over to you for judgment and hope you will find it in your heart to be lenient. The fat man sputtered in disbelief, while the rest of the villagers looked fearful for their lives. The rest of the civilian councillors stood bowed to Saratobi as one. Saratobi bowed back as the councillors began to file out of the room in silence. Kaharu and Hamura sat with their mouths open, unable to comprehend the fact their little scheme to undermine the Hokage's authority had failed so spectacularly. Danzo cleared his throat. Saratobi turned. Do you have something you wish to add, Danzo? With your permission, Hokage-sama, Danzo began. Saratobi narrowed his eyes, the deference Danzo was showing meant he wanted something. I would like to personally question these upstanding citizens. I want to be absolutely certain that there was no evidence of instigation by a foreign power. He paused before continuing. I'm also sure there is much I can do to help these citizens from making the same mistake again. Ah. Saratobi understood now. Though Danzo and Saratobi did not always see eye to eye, they both cared for Naruto in their own ways. Saratobi cared about Naruto because he was a favored grandchild and the village owed him a great deal for he and his parents' sacrifice. Danzo cared about Naruto much the same way a samurai carefully looked after his swords. 
Saratobi correctly read Danzo's hidden meaning, let me handle this for you. These fools need to be taught a lesson that you can't be seen teaching. And Danzo was truly angry a bunch of drunken village idiots had nearly cost Konoha an irreplaceable military weapon. I would greatly appreciate your help in this matter, Saratobi said evenly. But if you would, can you please give this man your personal attention? He nodded to the fat man, who paled visibly. Of course, I will be sure to find out everything he knows. Danzo nodded as he stood and bowed. Saratobi returned the bow. Escort these fine citizens down to interrogation. The Anbu nodded and herded the shivering villagers out the door with Danzo in tow. The rest of you are dismissed. Saratobi said to no one in particular. The war council nodded and shuffled out while quietly chattering among themselves. Hamura and Kaharu followed, fuming all the while. Tsuritobi was for once, thankful for Danzo. Though he found Danzo's methods distasteful, sometimes distasteful methods were necessary. Especially in the shinobi world. Tsuritobi mused. Tsuritobi made a mental note to send Danzo a fruit basket later. But first, he will see how Naruto is doing. Naruto flailed and lifted his head out of the water, gagging as he struggled to breathe. The dry heaved for a couple of seconds before sitting upright and looking around. Where did the old man go? Hello? Is anyone there? Silence. Naruto frowned and surveyed his surroundings. He was sitting in a partially flooded corridor with what appeared to be concrete floors under the stagnating water. The walls were covered in pipes of varying sizes, while the ceiling was plastered colored red by what appeared to be emergency lighting. I should get out of here, I don't want to get in any trouble. Naruto cautiously reached out and poked his right ankle sighing with relief when there was no pain. He used the metal pipes along the walls to pull himself up to a standing position. Uh, someone fixed my pants. Naruto looked down at his pants in bewilderment. But decided he can find that out after he got out of here. He glanced up and down the corridor. Off to his right, the corridor stretched on into utter darkness. To his left, the corridor seemed to be lit with emergency lights much like where he was standing. Opting for what seems to be the safest path, Naruto turned to his left and started walking. Fifteen minutes later the red emergency lights ran out. Naruto stared into the darkness ahead of him. Hey I can see something. He squinted. Sure enough, there was a tiny glimmer of light. Naruto put his hand on the pipes in the wall, using them to guide him towards the light. Whatever he had expected at the end of the corridor, this wasn't it. The corridor opened up into a massive cubicle space. The space was so massive Naruto could see the walls and the ceiling fade and stretch into darkness. In front of him was what appeared to be a massive cage with thick metal pillars for the cage bars. A red hill of fur sat behind the cage bars. Naruto approached the cage entrance. As he put held out his hand to touch the bars, an invisible barrier blocked his movement. A series of black inscriptions sprang to life and glowed green. A sudden movement past the bars caught his eye. Naruto backed up slowly as the red hill shook and uncurled itself. The top of the hill lifted and opened up backwards, dividing into nine, waving tails. The front of the hill lifted itself higher and higher, two black streaks appearing from the middle and sweeping to the left and right side. Naruto craned his neck and stared. The streaks opened up revealed impossibly large eyes. A mouth as wide as Kanoha Central Avenue opened up and revealed a row of razor-sharp teeth, each to hide an adult male. The creature wiggled its ears and stretched its arms above its head to yawn. The creature had a distinctively foxy look to it. Naruto stared with his mouth. It put its head back down lazily and stared right at Naruto, studying him in silence. I must be dreaming. A deep rumbling laughter escaped the fox. You weren't dreaming. The fox informed him. Wow. It reads minds. Amazing. No, I can't read minds. But I can read faces very, very easily, especially stupid ones like yours. The fox mocked him. Don't call my face stupid, stupid. Naruto shouted angrily as the fox roared with laughter at the weak comeback. Just who do you think you are anyway, huh? Don't you know who I am? The fox stopped laughing and stared straight at him, you are Yuzumaki Naruto. He stated deadpan. Naruto went silent. He didn't expect that answer. He shouted again while jabbing his finger at the creature. Well who the heck are you then? The fox raised itself to its full height and stared down at Naruto. I am known as the Nine-Tailed Demon Fox, the creature's voice boomed with power in the empty space. You humans also call me the Lord of Destruction, Agony and Despair made manifest. The trickster god who steals from all. Naruto nearly fell over from the sheer volume of the proclamation. The fox trailed off into a barely audible whisper, and I am the reason everyone hates you. Silence. What? Chapter 3. A new friend. What? Naruto exclaimed as he stared at the mountain-sized fox in front of him. You'll have to be more specific with that question. The fox stated tolessly. Naruto crossed his arms in front of him, his eyes closed and his mouth upturned into a frown. Despite desperately wanting to know why he was hated, he was more curious about the creature in front of him. And since he already knows my name, Naruto opened his eyes and asked, you say people call you the nine-tailed demon fox, but do you have a name? Yes. 
The fox smiled but offered nothing more, though his tail started waving back and forth. Naruto pressed on impatiently, can you tell me your name? The creature's face broke into a grin, my name is Kurama. Okay Kurama, can you tell me where we are and how we can get out of here? Not bad. He's more interested about getting out of here than playing 20 questions. He might not know it, but he is pretty sharp. Kurama observed. We are currently inside your head, Kurama informed him, everything you are seeing right now is your imagination, except me, of course. But how do I get out of here? Naruto insisted. You will leave here once you wake up. And that will be. Soon. Your body is fine, you're exhausted from running so much. Kurama huffed, tell me what do you remember? I remember a lot of shouting, a lot of people chasing me a voice telling me where to go Naruto trailed off as realization hit him, that was you wasn't it? Kurama nodded his massive head. How did you know where Jiji was? Naruto asked. I didn't. Naruto stared. Naruto, I've been around for a very very long time. I've been in Konoha for almost as long as there was a Konoha. I've seen the entire village a dozen times over. I know where every single clan lives. Wait, so you're older than Jiji. A lot older. Seriously. Seriously. Now, back to your question. I didn't know where the Hokage was for sure, but I do know where the most prestigious clans are including the Siratobi clan compound. And since he is the clan leader, Naruto nodded but asked, but what if you were wrong and the old man wasn't there? Hirama shrugged, the clan knows the Hokage likes you. Even if he was not there his family or clan members probably would have came out to help. Naruto smiled, secretly pleased that the old man was fond of him. Since Kurama already told him he wasn't able to leave until he woke up, he decided to ask the question that was at the top of his mind. So why are you the reason everyone hates me? Naruto asked. They think I'm you. They think since I have done evil things in the past, you will do evil things sooner or later too. And before you ask, no I was not directly responsible for the things I'm accused of. It just so happens a good portion of the human population find it acceptable to assign guilt by association. If that's true then how come everyone still hates you? Hirama shrugged, there is no way they will believe a demon fox over the words of another person, it's easier for your kind to cope with this world if they can somehow rationalize random events. That's not fair to us though. Naruto exclaimed angrily, though he barely understood half of Kurama's explanations. All Naruto knew was he didn't like being blamed for things he didn't do, Kurama found it oddly touching that Naruto was angry on his behalf, despite having just met each other. I'll have to break his illusions a little this world is short on compassion Kurama thought sadly. Naruto, Kurama said softly, this world is not fair. Bad things happen to good people all the time. You should know that better than anyone. Naruto looked away and said nothing. Hirama comforted him, words are just words Naruto, they only have as much power as you give them. Don't be a person who is weak enough to be hurt by words okay. In my experience, actions speak louder than words anyway. Naruto nodded and grinned. So, why are you inside me? Because you were the best choice to contain me. How much do you know about me anyway? Naruto shrugged and gave him the patented I don't know anything look. Hirama sighed. These explanations are always difficult, especially when the person asking the question is barely capable of going to the bathroom without help. I'm a fox made out of pure chakra. Kurama said, trying his best to keep the explanation simple, there are people out there who are willing to use me without hesitation to harm other humans. I've been locked away to make sure I will not be used. But why me? Why are you locked inside me? Naruto jabbed his fingers at Kurama, then to himself. Because the Uzumaki clan, what little is left of it, was known to have huge chakra reserves. And, Takra is needed to power the prison you are in. Naruto finished for him. Hirama was suitably impressed by Naruto's power of deduction. Naruto, I want to ask you something. Kurama stated, I want you to take some time and think about your answer before you tell me okay. Okay. What do you want to be when you grow up? Without any hesitation Naruto answered, that's easy. I want to be Hokage. This is my surprise face. Why? So I can be the strongest shinobi and protect people like Chiji protected me. Hirama nodded his head so very much like your parents. This would be what they call the will of fire isn't it? Good reason, Kurama smiled as Naruto glowed from the praise. Now let's see how much he knows. Do you know what a Hokage's job is, aside from protecting people? Naruto scratched his head, stamped paperwork. Kurama gave a short barking laugh. That's a tiny part of it, yes. Anything else? Naruto had now answer for him then. Well he is only four years old can't expect anything from someone who has been ignored all his life. Kurama concluded. You are right in saying the Hokage is the strongest shinobi in the village, it's not the only reason he is Hokage, but it's a pretty big part of it, Kurama informed him, though, it will be next to impossible for you to become Hokage with the way you are now. Why not? I promise I'll work hard. Naruto pouted. Kurama shook his head, I know you will work hard Naruto, but that will only take you so far if you have no one to guide you. You are already behind kids your age because they have family and clan members to teach them. You have nothing. 
Baruto slumped. It was true, aside from the caretakers that made him do the chakra exercises, he didn't really have any attachment to anyone else aside from the old man. However, Kurama said carefully, I am willing to teach you as long as you agree to the following three conditions. Naruto perked up at this. He leaned in and listened intently. 1. You will keep our relationship a secret from everyone unless I specify otherwise. This is mostly so people will see you as you and not the demon fox as you. Naruto thought about it for a second, then nodded. 2. You will follow my instructions without hesitation or question at all times. You will give me your full attention in class. Wasting time, especially when someone else is helping you, is very disrespectful. Naruto nodded again. Third, you will never kill or hurt someone unless you have no possible alternative. Naruto was fine with that. He was never really full convinced of the darker aspects of the shinobi world, even if everyone else around him had acknowledged it as common practice. He suspected sooner or later his illusions would be shattered. Having the fox been on the same page as him in regards to violence greatly comforted him though. Do you agree to these conditions and form a pact with me? Kurama asked. Naruto nodded yet again. Say the words please. Kurama said formally. I Naruto struggled to find the words. Kurama mouthed the words at Naruto, so the four-year-old could follow along I Uzumaki Naruto agree to this pact with the conditions listed. The entire room glowed briefly green for a second. Good. Despite his young age, Naruto asked, what do you get out of this Kurama? Naruto had learned pretty early on nothing in life was free. He's catching on fast. Kurama thought. Did you know Naruto, Kurama began, that I was created by someone who believed in peace. Naruto I Kurama in silence. My creator believed that the power he wielded was too great and that eventually someone would find and abuse that power. He divided his power and created us to prevent one person from gaining an unfair advantage over men. Naruto's eyes widened at the thought of multiple tailed beasts out there, each as powerful as Kurama. He died believing that humans will be able to attain peace through understanding and acceptance by being friends to one another. I am hoping that you will be able to fulfill his desire. Naruto nodded his head excitedly. I'll be friends with everyone in the whole world. Believe it. Kurama smiled. A bit naive but no more than an immortal intelligent chakra entity hoping for world peace. He mused. Let's seal our friendship then, I'll show you exactly how this is going to work. Naruto watched in fascination as Kurama gently pushed his hand against the cage. The protective inscriptions appeared again as he met the barrier. Put your right hand against the barrier like this. Kurama demonstrated by mirroring with his left hand. Naruto copied his movements. Gather a bit of chakra at your index finger here and push it out against the barrier like those exercises you did. Naruto complied. Now trace your fingers after mine. Naruto traced a long line of inscriptions across the entire length of the front cage. As soon as he finished, the entire room, cage and all, began shaking violently. Naruto backed up nervously as a wall of crisscrossing inscriptions appeared all over the cage and glowed blue. The inscription Naruto traced glowed green and floated off the cage to five steps in front of Naruto. The single line of inscriptions curled in on itself and formed circle in the air as the other blue inscriptions and protective wards peeled off the cage. They drifted towards the green circular inscription and began to attach themselves, each line of inscription interlocking with each other and around the circle, with a series of muffled click. As the last of the inscriptions attached themselves, the cage bars retracted into the water and the cage ceiling shot upwards into the darkness. Now hold out your hand with your palms down. Naruto put his left hand forward cautiously. The green circle floated lazily downwards while reorienting itself to face the sky. It began pulsing rapidly as it made contact with the back of Naruto's hand before sinking into his skin and fading away seamlessly. Naruto pulled his hand back and examined it. There was no sign of a seal there at all. What did we do just now? Naruto asked, curious by the sealing ritual Kurama had guided him to through. I improved on the seal that holds me inside you. Kurama said with a proud look on his face. Kurama had been nothing if not productive in the last four years, even if it was because he was bored out of his mind inside while been imprisoned inside an infant's body. The cage that was holding me was designed so that I can't harm you or take over your body. A massive cage like that also takes a lot of chakra to maintain, your chakra more specifically. This constant drain makes it extremely difficult for you to perform any jutsu. What I've done is alter the protections wards so that you wear it like an invisible suit of armor. Observe. Before Naruto could say anything, Kurama raised one of his arms up and swung it down against Naruto. Naruto screamed in fright and shut his eyes. Kurama's massive paw didn't touch him. It was held in place by an invisible spherical barrier a feet away from Naruto's head. Naruto glared. That was mean. Naruto shouted. Forgive me, forgive me, Kurama laughed. But as you can see, the seal prevents me from doing any harm to you. Now, take your right hand and place it on top of your left. Good. Push a little bit of chakra out your right palm. As Naruto did so, the green inscription circle appeared and floated slightly above his left hand. 
Now twist it gently clockwise there that's good, now pull your hands apart. Kurama instructed. Naruto turned the circle slightly. The circle glowed and pulsed lightly before sinking back onto his skin and disappearing. Naruto looked puzzled. Now watch what I can do. The space in between Naruto and Kurama suddenly exploded outwards with smoke. When the smoke cleared, there was a simple wood desk and chair. Naruto looked at the furniture, then back at Kurama. It was pretty anticlimactic. You can make furniture now. Naruto was disappointed. Kurama sighed. Not impressed are we? Stand still please. Kurama closed his eyes and inhaled. The loud rumbling in the ground almost caused Naruto to lose his balance and stumble. The walls around him fell backward soundlessly, the horizon now dark in all directions. The water drained away into the cracks on the ground before it fell away into total abyss. For a few terrifying moments Naruto was standing on nothingness. A green speck rushed upwards from the darkness below and expanded outwards at an incredible pace. The landscape beneath him slowed, then stopped as it made contact with Naruto's feet. Naruto found himself on the white shores of a glittering blue lake. Green plains with gentle rolling hills stretched in every direction beyond the lake and populated by ankle-high grass. Naruto looked upwards and was greeted by a dazzling array of stars set against a cloudless dark blue sky. A gentle breeze washed over him and swept the grass back in waves. Blowing insects danced and then fluttered in the air near the grass. Naruto stared in wonder. Hirama grinned and looked down at the odd Naruto. Still got it. This is just a tiny bit of what I can do now. Naruto nodded dumbly. This is beautiful. Naruto spoke finally. It feels so real. He said as he squatted down and grabbed a fistful of the glittering white sand. Hirama felt his ego grow. Just a little bit. Wait one second, I'm going to change my size so we can speak as equals. Hirama blew out an extended breath, deflating in size as more and more rushed out of his mouth. Naruto stared at Kurama in amazement again as the mountain-sized fox shrank quickly into something that was closer to the average house cat. Kurama's appearance stayed roughly the same, except his eyes were disproportionately larger compared to the rest of his body. His nine tails were also dramatically shorter and wider, with the consistency of a soft downy pillow. He was in short, a cat-sized plushy toy. Kurama got off his haunches and trotted over to Naruto. Naruto.Now we can begi. Naruto cut him off at the side of the adorable talking plushy, oh my god it's sucky if you and Tusku's eaten old it. The vein popped up above Kurama's right eye. A blur of something orange slapped Naruto across the face. What was that for? I thought you said the seal protected me. Naruto shouted as Kurama slowly retracted one of his extended tails. Nothing can protect you from your own stupidity. Kurama stated firmly, I am here to push you as hard as you can as fast as you can. If you want to become Hokage, you need to start now. At your age the previous Hokages had already decided on their specialization and started learning basic Jutsus. Kurama informed him. Naruto gasped, they were already learning Jutsus. Kurama nodded, indeed. They didn't become Hokage by being the best paper stamper in the world, they became Hokages because they were powerful and everyone knew it. However, strength comes in many forms, Kurama tapped his head with his finger, how you use the right power, how much power to use those are all lessons you need to learn before you take on the world. Naruto nodded in understanding. Strength was just another piece that made up the whole puzzle, he'll need to study just as hard as he trains. He will get strong, I promise you that. We'll start out with the basics first however. One must learn to crawl before he sprints. Kurama said sagely. I will start by explaining this world to you, since you will be spending a lot of time here. As I said before, this world exists inside your head. The first thing you should know is that time here passes slower compared to the outside. How much slower? About four times, though we can stretch it out to eight if necessary. So this means, this means you will have a lot of time to acquire the knowledge you need, from the basics like reading and writing to more advanced things like specific clan practices and etiquette. By the time you graduate from the academy, you should have a huge advantage compared to kids your age. That doesn't really seem fair to the rest of them. Naruto frowned. Still going on about fairness I see you are a shinobi. Kurama stated simply, as if that was all the answer he needed. And it really was too. If it's any consolation, think of it as a balance for having private tutors and family members to teach them. Naruto conceded the point. I've also altered the laws in this world slightly. Kurama redirected Naruto's attention, everything here right now is a perfect reflection of the real world. The way the wind blows, the volume of water, the speed at which things fall to the earth things like that. This will allow you to practice judas, sealing, trapping, and various katas while you sleep. However, you will still need to perform experimental jutsus in the real world. I cannot simulate something that I have no experience with. That makes sense. Are we doing anything else when I am awake? Growing mostly. Naruto blinked. Hirama elaborated, you need to grow physically. You need to develop muscles, grow taller, improve your stamina as well as your chakra pool. Well I won't grow just because I want to. Naruto stated. Most of it involves doing the right exercises. 
I will do what I can to help your body mature slightly faster, just enough to make it seem like you have an early growth spurt, but not enough to arouse any suspicions. You'll also need to eat properly, which means I will teach you how to cook. Hirama didn't trust any of the prepared food the villager might sell or give to Naruto. Cooking? Like with fire? That sounds fun. It's fun as long as you don't burn the kitchen down. Please what do you take me for? Naruto retorted confidently. Your mother's son. Kurama thought back to Kishina's failed brownies. Something else you will need to grow in the real world is a healthy reputation. You need to cultivate allies, form allies, maybe even meet a girl and start a family, solidify your lineage. Girls are gross. Naruto turned his nose up at Kurama. Just like Kishina, but she sang a different tune at the end they all do. Tastes change. Has no one given you the talk before? Kurama tilted his head in curiosity as his tail started to wave. What are you talking about? Naruto raised his eyebrows. Kurama smiled and held his hands out. Two small puffs of smoke appeared from on his hands. When the smoke cleared there were two small fox plushies facing each other. One had red fur, the other gold. You see Naruto, when a mommy fox and a daddy fox loves each other very much he began as he moved the two foxes towards each other. Naruto's eyes went wide with primordial horror. He was absolutely positive this is something he didn't need to know about, irregardless of the fact that he might gain some insight into the mystery that is his parents. He brought his hands to his ears and started chanting. Lalala I'm not listening I'm not listening. Hirama roared with laughter as he tossed the plushies in the air and they puffed out of existence. Naruto lowered his hands and glared at him. Kurama's laughter died down, you're about a decade too early for this education anyway. Naruto said nothing but muttered Hiro Kitsune underneath his breath. What was that? Kurama demanded. Nothing. Naruto sang sweetly. That's what I thought. When I meant building a reputation, I mean doing tasks or solving problems in such a way as to leave a lasting positive impression on people. So this way when the time comes for the next Hokage is chosen, people will have a favorable opinion of you. Having friends and allies will also help by as they would vouch for you when you are not around. Naruto nodded. He would love to have a big circle of friends. He turned his attention back to Kurama he was still talking. I will also be working on some things while you are growing. That got Naruto's curiosity, what will you be working on? Oh, this and Thadi have some people in this world who I need to contact. They might be able to help you achieve your dreams, they might not. But I do need to find out first. Who are they? What are they like? What do they do? Will I meet them? Naruto rapidly fired off a series of questions. Hirama held up his hand to stop Naruto, most of them gather information. There are also a few who do more than gather information I let you know when I have some good news. Do you trust them? A good question. Kurama smiled, yes, I trust them absolutely. You can even say we are of one mind. Kurama laughed inwardly at his own joke. Naruto was slightly puzzled at Kurama's answer, but decided he will ask him more later. Okay Naruto, it's almost time for you to go. Once you get back to the real world I would you to do a couple of things so we can get started right away. But don't forget about your promise either. Kurama reminded him. Don't worry. I never break my promises. Believe it. Naruto gave Kurama a thumbs up followed by a nice guy pose. Oh brother. Kurama rolled his eyes. Naruto stuck out his hand to Kurama expectantly. Kurama stared at it. Friends? Naruto asked. Friends? Kurama stated in the affirmative. An impossibly huge grin formed on Naruto's face which Kurama returned. You know kid, I think this the beginning of a beautiful partnership. Naruto stirred from his sleep. The bed he laid on was so soft he felt like he was sinking into it. Fighting the urge to indulge, he threw up his hands and yawned loudly as he sat up. Naruto surveyed his surroundings, he was in a hospital room. The bed occupied dominated the middle of the plaster white room, to the left of the bed, there was with a small coffee table and two sofa chairs facing each other. The right side of the room held a brown wooden door and no other furniture. Two large windows, one next to the sofas and one across from the bed, were covered with beige curtains and provided muted lighting. Naruto poured himself a cup of water from the pitcher on the nightstand next to his bed and drank noisily. Naruto put his left foot down first, before gently transferring weight to his right to test his ankle. He breathed a sign of relief as he felt no pain. Naruto walked over to the window across from the bed and drew back the curtains. He shielded his eyes as the room filled with brilliant sunlight. The window offered an unobstructed view of Kanoha's Central Avenue. The scene was quite subdued in comparison to the excitement of last night's festivities. Small groups of janitors and sweepers in blue and green dotted the village circle, leaving behind a path of cleanliness as they wandered about in seemingly random direction. Light sounds of hammering and sawing filled the air as various vendors broke their stalls down and loaded them onto ox carts. Naruto brought up his left hand and gazed at the back of it. There was no sign of the seal. What a strange dream. He thought. It wasn't a dream, and don't you forget about your promises, Kit. A voice said. Naruto looked around and asked the empty air, Kurama. 
does think in clear sentences and I'll understand what you are saying. No point in letting people think you talk to yourself. Naruto thought to himself. Is this better? I knew you would get the hang of it quick. Wait, someone is coming. Is it danger? Naruto asked. I don't sense any hostile intent. You should be fine. A gentle knock on the door made Naruto jump. Naruto. A familiar voice called out from behind the door. Naruto turned to see an Anbu agent with a dog mask holding the door open for Suratobi. The old man was wearing the official red hokage kimono and white overcoat he was commonly seen in. He took off his official hat and smiled at Naruto as he tapped into the room. The agent closed the door behind Suratobi to give them a measure privacy. Hey old man. Naruto greeted Suratobi happily. He sprang across the room in three steps to give him a hug. Suratobi hugged Naruto back and set him down. He smiled and ruffled the young boy's hair. Ho ho ho, good morning Naruto. How are you doing today? He asked and leaned over, are you feeling any pain at all? Nope. I'm perfectly fine. Naruto proclaimed and demonstrated his by running circles around Suratobi. Suratobi smiled slightly slightly. Perhaps it's because thanks to the fox. Naruto slowed down and stopped in front Suratobi. He looked down and asked nervously, I'm I'm not in any trouble am I? What? Oh no, no not at all. I just wanted to see how you were doing. And it would be great if you could tell me what you remembered from last night. Saratobi smiled and gestured to the sofa chairs. As Naruto and Saratobi settled into the seats opposite one another, Saratobi called out. Dog, can you bring me some tea please? Naruto's stomach growled loudly and Saratobi laughed. And find the boy some breakfast while you're at it please. Make it a good one. Hi, Hokajama. Came the response from the behind the door. Now that I know you are fine, why don't you tell me everything that happened last night? You promise I won't get in any trouble? Naruto asked. I promise Naruto. Now go on. Remember your promise. Kurama reminded him gently in the back of his mind. Well, last night I was trying to sleep, but all these explosions in the sky woke me up. And I really wanted to see what all the noise was so I snuck out from the orphanage and, wait, no one saw you. Well yay, cause I didn't use the door. I climbed out of the window on the roof. How did you get down from there? Saratobi was aghast as he recalled that the bedrooms were on the second floor of the orphanage. There were these new pipes that lets the water flow out all at the same place, so I grabbed one and slid down. On one hand, Saratobi was horrified that a four-year-old had done something so dangerous as to climb down from a drainage pipe without supervision. On the other hand, he forced himself to admit the kid had shown real talent by adapting to the environment to get what he wanted, not that he would ever tell Naruto that though. Dog reappeared next to the coffee table with a large black tray broke. On the tray was a glass of milk, a white dish with a silver plate cover, a small white pitcher with something golden inside, utensils, and a steaming green ceramic cup. Saratobi nodded his thanks as Dog handed him the cup first. Dog set the black tray down in front of Naruto and pulled the plate cover off. Naruto let out aloud as the plate revealed a stack of steaming golden brown pancakes. Yes. Pancakes. My favorite Naruto pumped his fists in the air in excitement. Thanks Mr. Dog. Thanks old man. I did Akamasu. Naruto shouted as he poured out the syrup, grabbed the fork, and dove in. Saratobi took a small sip from his cup and smiled. He could sense satisfaction radiating off Dog as he retreated from the room. So the fat guy with the megaphone saw me and started yelling, and then everyone was yelling and chasing me and throwing stuff, and I found this house and fell asleep because I was so tired. But he doesn't remember the worst part of what happened. Saratobi was curious though, how did you know to run to my house? Naruto laughed nervously in between mouthfuls of pancakes, that was your house old man I must have gotten real lucky huh? Yes. Kami must really be looking out for you Naruto. The coincidence. Maybe I can count the number of people who would help him out in a pinch in this village on one hand, though Saratobi made up his mind. He can't go back to the orphanage. Those villagers from last night have friends and family who would no doubt want to seek revenge against Naruto. Saratobi briefly toyed with the idea of bringing Naruto to live with him at the compound, but decided against such a blatant show of favoritism. Sooner or later someone will notice the likeness between the Naruto and Minato and put two and two together. Saratobi settled on a compromise. As much as Saratobi wanted to devote his time to Naruto, too much of it will draw the deadly sort of attention that a four-year-old doesn't need. He will set Naruto up in one of the apartment complexes that rents to ninjas. This will allow him to keep an eye on Naruto without too much suspicion. Listen Naruto, Saratobi began. Naruto stopped chewing as his cheeks bulged with half-eaten pancakes. You don't have to stop eating, just listen while you eat. Naruto resumed chewing, but narrowed his eyes at Saratobi. How would you like to live by yourself? It will be very different. You will need to learn how to take care of yourself, like cook food and wash clothes, but think of it as a test to see if you are capable of. Saratobi was interrupted as Naruto had flown out of his seat and gave him a bear hug. 
Really old man really Naruto asked excitedly as a huge smile adorned his face. Pancake crumbs fell on Saratobi as he tried to pry Naruto off. Hirama radiated approval outwards. We can get started on training right away. He told Naruto. Yes really. We'll have lunch together every week and you can let me know how you are doing. And as I was about to say, if you stay out of trouble I'll even let you go to the academy. This is good. The pieces are falling into place. Karama was secretly pleased by this turn of events. Thanks old man. Naruto shouted and hugged him tighter. You're awesome. Saratobi smiled and directed Naruto back to his pancakes. Naruto, I have some things to take of. Stay here for the day and try to give anyone any trouble okay. And don't sneak out anymore. He warned Naruto, who nodded as he shoved another pancake into his mouth. I'll make the arrangements and take you to your new home this afternoon. Saratobi got up and moved exit the room. Naruto smiled and waved at him, cheeks puffy with pancakes. Saratobi waved back and went through the threshold. Keep guard on this room. Saratobi said to no one in particular after he closed the door behind him. The leaves on the potted plant facing the door waved and dipped in the windless hallway. Chapter 4. Learning new things. This sucks. Naruto said out loud as he paced restlessly back and forth in the hospital room. I'm so bored. Thirty minutes passed since the silver-haired dog had vanished with the empty breakfast tray, and Naruto was mentally punching himself for not asking the Anbu for a deck of cards or a manga to keep himself occupied. Hirama spoke up. Naruto, why don't you come in here? We might as well get started on the basics. How do I get back? Naruto asked. Just find a comfortable spot and lay down. I'll take care of the rest. Came the response. Naruto eyed the furniture in the room. Make sure it's a good spot. You probably don't want to wake up with a cramp. Karama suggested helpfully. Naruto opted to go back to the bed, there was no telling when he would experience this type of luxury again. As Naruto sat back down, he could feel himself sinking into the mattress. He grew heavier as the cool autumn breeze and lazy morning sun overwhelmed him. Naruto opened his eyes to a turquoise blue sky partially obscured by brilliant sunlight. Shielding his eyes from the midday sun with his forearm, Naruto sat up in the bed of grass he found himself lying on. Despite the brilliant sunshine, the temperature of the air remained cool and comfortable. Welcome back. A voice from behind Naruto caused him to turn his head around. Karama materialized out from in between the blades of grass. Naruto pivoted his sitting position so he was facing Karama and smiled. Thanks for getting me out of that room. What are we going to do first? I want to start by evaluating your chakra control. Here, Karama swiped half a handful of grass from the ground and handed it to Naruto, who groaned slightly. Put a blade of grass on your forehead and keep it there without your hands. Naruto laughed. Easy, I can do this in my sleep. So show me. Karama countered. The exercise was a variation to the leaf concentration exercise taught at the academy, students were required to keep a leaf on their forehead as a means of concentrating their chakra at a particular focal point. But because a single blade of grass occupied a much smaller surface area, whoever was practicing the technique had to be more precise in focusing their chakra. Naruto reached up and placed a single blade of grass on his forehead and stared upwards as it stayed right where he placed it. Hirama nodded in approval, good, good he stared in fascination as Naruto placed six more blades of grass equally spaced apart on his forehead. Interesting. A jutsu was a two-step process, a typical shinobi needed to mold chakra first and then manifest the desired jutsu, which is done by performing hand seals. It was also possible to perform seal-less jutsu through extensive practice and or if an individual was gifted with strong will. Developing multiple chakra focal points essentially cut down the preparation time for a jutsu in half, since a user only needed time to manifest a desired jutsu and not spend time molding the chakra. And if the kid has a strong will like his mother, Naruto, when did you learn to do that? Karama asked. What do you mean? Naruto stared upwards as he kept the seven blades of grass glued to his forehead, I learned this at the orphanage. They don't teach you to hold more than one leaf at a time, let alone seven. Karama stated. It just feels right you know. It's kinda like pouring a cup of water, except instead of one cup, you pour seven cups at the same time. Naruto explained to the best of his abilities. So he's doing it subconsciously then. Instead of splitting his concentration seven times, he is just duplicating the same concentration seven times. Hirama contemplated if Naruto's seemingly casual affinity with chakra was a freakish combination of his own chakra influence, the Uzumaki clan's gift of monstrous chakra pools, and Namaka's clan's natural inclination for all things related to shinobi techniques. He has unlimited potential. Karama thought. He felt like he was gazing upon a brilliant echo of his creator. Oh. Naruto cried disappointingly as the grass fell off his forehead. So, how did I do? Naruto looked back at Karama. Good. Very good. Karama admitted. Credit where credit's due. You have the basic exercise down, so let's move on to the next step. 
Three saplings sprouted up from the ground behind him. The saplings shot towards the sky and thickened into thick trunks as branches grew out quickly in all directions. As the trees stopped their growth, the barren branches exploded with a vibrant green as leaves burst forth from the branches. You will now climb a tree. Kurama instructed. Naruto frowned. He knew how to climb a tree, he hadn't spent all those days in the forest by himself without picking up something useful. His frown was soon replaced by open-mouthed surprise as Kurama walked casually up a tree and sat on the first branch. He looked down at Naruto expectantly. Naruto, I want to see if you can figure out how to perform the exercise for yourself. Observation, awareness, and application of knowledge are important lessons you must learn for yourself, regardless of whether or not you are a shinobi. I will demonstrate again for you. But that Kurama jumped off the tree and walked back up, slowly this time as Naruto moved in close and observed where Kurama's feet made contact with the tree trunk. Naruto took two steps back, folded his arms and closed his eyes to contemplate what he saw. Remembering that this was an exercise, Naruto came to the conclusion Kurama was performing a variation of the leaf exercise. Ah. So that's how you do it. Naruto nodded in realization. Instead of attaching the grass to my forehead, I'm attaching myself to the tree. Naruto unfolded his arms and let it hang loose down his side. He kept his eyes closed in concentration while focusing a small amount of chakra at his feet. Naruto's eyes snapped open and he moved confidently to the tree and planted his left foot on the bark. Then promptly slipped and fell on his back. Kurama held his laughter back. He had never met or seen any human succeed on the first try anyway. Maybe I should use more chakra. Naruto thought as he stood back up and stared at where he lost his step. Dusting himself off, he closed his eyes once again and focused chakra at his feet, this time pouring quite a bit more chakra than the previous attempt. Naruto planted his left foot firmly on the trunk again and flew back a good five meters as the trunk underneath his feet exploded. Naruto sputtered as fine wood dust floated in the air. You are on the right track, Kurama encouraged him from atop the branch, the first attempt had too little chakra, the second attempt too much. Naruto nodded and walked back to the starting point. He concentrated chakra at his feet again, this time pouring slightly less chakra into his feet. He cautiously planted his left foot against the trunk again. The trunk groaned and the bark bent inward slightly, but did not explode as Naruto eased more weight on. Seeing that his foot was sticking to the trunk, Naruto concentrated the same amount of chakra on his right foot and pushed himself off the ground. He found himself staring upwards into the tree in parallel to the ground. Kurama nodded his approval as Naruto slowly and carefully worked his way up to the branch where Kurama was sitting, one foot at a time. Naruto sat down next to him and grinned. Excellent. You are making good progress. Something you should be aware of is that the amount of chakra necessary will depend on what you are trying to climb and will also be dependent on how heavy you are and how fast you are moving. Kurama laid out the fundamental knowledge regarding the exercise. Naruto nodded, that makes sense. Can I practice a bit more? Of course. Kurama hopped off the branch and landed silently. The ground rumbled slightly as a flat concrete wall two meters wide rose up out of the ground. A second wall made of glass rose and joined the concrete. A third wall of solid soil rose up beside the glass. Try using these different walls for practice. Once you are confident with walking up on these walls, try running. A yellow backpack puffed into existence at the base of the concrete wall. That is a special backpack that will change weight every minute, put that on before you start. Naruto hopped off the branch and slipped the backpack on. He moved over to the concrete wall and placed his foot on the surface. Kurama called an end to the exercise once he saw that Naruto mastered the wall climbing exercise. Naruto was now capable running up all of the walls with a backpack and not leaving a mark behind, which is kind of important for any active shinobi. It's strange, how come I don't feel tired at all? Naruto asked as Kurama took the backpack from him with one of his tails. Because this space is just a very good imitation of real life. You can't really get tired if your body doesn't do any real work. Kurama told him, it's perfect for learning and practicing what we already know, but the best way to find out your limits or test an experimental jutsu is doing it in real life. Now, let's move on to the last exercise. Follow me. Kurama didn't feel the urge to tell Naruto that he would experience mental exhaustion all the same, Kurama's gift of regeneration made it all a moot point anyway. Naruto followed as Kurama led him up and over the hill behind the trees. As they reached the top of the hill Naruto saw the crystal blue lake again. Kurama led him down to the pristine white shores. This is the last exercise we will do for now. Observe closely. Kurama stepped out onto the water. Instead of sinking or getting wet, his foot stayed level and slightly above the water. Naruto could see a faint depression where Kurama's foot made invisible contact with the water surface. Kurama walked for 20 paces, turned around, and sat on his haunches facing Naruto. Give it a try. Naruto folded his arms and thought back to the last exercise. This should be similar to tree climbing. 
If I use too little chakra, I'll slip and get wet, and if I use too much, the water will splash everywhere. Using the knowledge he gained from the previous exercise and what Kurama had said about different materials requiring different chakra amounts, Naruto poured just a tiny bit of chakra into his feet. Water wasn't solid, so it shouldn't take as much effort. Naruto smiled as he lowered his foot towards the water surface, but frowned as it got wet anyway he repeated again, this time observing the water more closely. The water near the surface was pushed down as the chakra made contact, but the water surrounding the depression quickly rushed in to fill the gap. If it keeps flowing back, then I will need to keep pushing down. Naruto put his foot forward again, however this time he bled out a constant amount of chakra from the soles of his feet. Yes. Naruto let out a tiny cheer inside him as his foot met firm resistance on the water. He put his right foot forward. Gently, gently. Hirama watched with amusement as Naruto stumbled haphazardly towards him on the lake. Ten paces in, Kurama threw the backpack at Naruto. Here. Think fast. Naruto's eyes widened as he scrambled and lunged for the airborne backpack. He managed to grab one of the straps as he lost chakra concentration before falling face first into the lake with a shout. Naruto flailed wildly and sent water everywhere as his entire body sank into the lake with a loud plunk. He came back up sputtering for air a moment later to find Kurama rolling on the water in laughter. Laugh it up furball. Naruto grumbled as Kurama picked up a very wet and miserable four-year-old and his backpack while walking back to the shore. Sorry, sorry. Kurama apologized with a twinkle in his eye as Naruto shot him an icy glare from behind, it was just too good of an opportunity to pass up. Besides, a shinobi should always be alert for unexpected surprises. Naruto mentally made a note to get the demon fox back as Kurama continued, practice this a bit more like with the climbing exercises. Try running again after you are confident with walking. You should be able to do this without thinking once you've mastered it, much like the previous exercise. Naruto nodded as Kurama helped slip the backpack back onto Naruto with two of his tails. He focused the chakra at his feet again and walked cautiously towards the water. Naruto's eyes fluttered open the same instant a knock came on the door. He rolled to face the door as it opened, and Suratobi stuck his head in. It was the afternoon already. Hey Naruto, you ready to get out of here? He asked with a smile. Yeah. Naruto cheered, I was so bored while you were gone Jiji. Naruto threw off the covers and hopped down from the bed. He put on his sandals and grabbed Suratobi's hand. The aging Hokage guided the young demon container out the door and down the hall, towards past the reception area. Doctors and nurses nodded at Suratobi in respect and glanced at Naruto in nervous curiosity as they filed past. Though they didn't show it, the hospital staff was extremely grateful none of the destructive rumors regarding the young boy was true. A few even revised their opinion of the child, since his quiet demeanor directly contradicted the warning and whisperings of the civilian council. Saratobi guided Naruto out of the large set of glass doors in the front entrance. They walked in the direction of the Hokage Tower and arrived at their destination two blocks and five minutes later. The first thought that came to Naruto as he took in the building in front of him was how extremely unassuming it was. The building was so plain it could have been uprooted and dropped off in Sunar Kumo, and no one would have been wiser. Whoever painted the apartment obviously had an overabundance of beige and red roof tiles. There were no windows on the first floor, only a set of wooden doors that gave way to a front office, which in turn blocked off access to a carefully maintained central garden. The og materialized and opened the front entrance for Saratobi and Naruto. The office they entered featured cheap blue carpeting, a faded wooden counter that looked way past its prime, and two circular wooden tables with a pair of chairs each. Naruto felt the urge to explore, but Saratobi held on to him tightly as he walked up to the counter and rang a rusty service bell. The wiry, skinny old man popped up from behind the desk. To Naruto, the man was positively ancient, he had a battered look about him accompanied by a receding gray hairline. His face was lined with wrinkles and age spots. Despite his advanced age, Naruto could felt as if the old man radiated dignity. The man bowed politely to Saratobi, welcome Hokage-sama. Saratobi nodded politely in return, and the old man turned his attention to Naruto, and this must be young Naruto. Welcome, young Naruto. My name is Katashi Mori, I am pleased to make your acquaintance. Naruto stared. Katashi was completely sincere in his statements. Naruto froze as he was unaccustomed to people who didn't shy away from him or shoot him dirty looks. Come on Naruto. Be polite. Kurama urged. Naruto realized Saratobi and Katashi were staring at him. Naruto took the cue and bowed. He then stuck out his hand at Katashi. I am pleased to meet you. Mori-sama. The old landlord flashed a toothy smile in approval. Please follow me, I will show you to your new home. Katashi led Saratobi and Naruto out into the carefully manicured courtyard filled with bonsai trees and up two flights of stairs to the third floor. This complex is dedicated to the needs of the Konoha Shinobi force, no civilians other than janitors and repairmen are permitted. As such, security and noise is not really an issue. It was true. 
though most genin kept normal business hours, once a shinobi made it to chunin working odd hours became a universal unsaid job requirement. And because shinobi kept such a different schedule, this meant there were at least a dozen shinobi in various states of alertness in the complex at any given time. Any fool who would incur the wrath of the shinobi in their own home often met painful ends. Saratobi hoped that this will keep the, the vengeful villagers away. Assuming the shinobi living here accept Naruto as one of their own. Here we are. Katashi stopped in front of room 306 and unlocked it. The Anbu came by earlier to drop off your personal belongings. Naruto laughed a little. Whatever belongings he had could fit in a small potato sack. I hope you find this to your liking. Katashi opened the door and stepped aside to let Saratobi and Naruto in. Naruto grinned as he examined his new studio apartment. The entrance opened up to a medium-sized beige carpeted living area twice the size of his room back at the orphanage. It contained a small wooden coffee table and a brown L-shaped sofa facing an empty counter. Behind the sofa was a bare sheet less queen-size bed flanked by a pair of white nightstands. The closet with a sliding door faced the bed on the right wall. Opposite the living room was a white tiled bathroom with a the standard porcelain toilet and sink. A metal shower head which drained into the corner of the room rounded out the bathroom furnishings. There was a medium-sized kitchen with a metal sink, two burner stoves, plenty of counter space, and numerous cabinets in the back left corner of the studio apartment. This will be adequate for our cooking lessons. Karama stated as he spied the kitchen area from Naruto's eyes. Tsuritobi walked over to the bed and threw open the curtains by the bed. Naruto gasped as the window provided him with an unobstructed view of the Hokage Tower and the monument. This is great. Naruto murmured happily. Tsuritobi nodded to Katashi, who handed Naruto the keys. Please remember other shinobi live in this building as well, be courteous to your neighbors and keep the noise level to a minimum. The complex will also be getting an upgrade to take advantage of electricity in the near future. I will let you know when we have a set date for the upgrade. Naruto nodded earnestly as Katashi handed him the keys. Katashi bowed to Saratobi and shuffled out the door, please enjoy your stay. He bowed once more and closed the door behind him. Saratobi watched Naruto went over to the bed and started hopping up and down. He laughed at the scene. This was something that is more fitting for a four-year-old. He enjoyed the scene of normalcy for another minute before remembering his duties. Saratobi called out, Naruto, I have to take care of some more paperwork back at the tower. How about I pick you up around six and we can have dinner. Naruto jumped off the bed and then landed in front of Saratobi in one leap before squeezing the old man in tight hug. Sure Jiji. Thanks again. Saratobi hugged back with a smile and closed the door behind him as he left, leaving Naruto alone in his new home. You should find some paper and pencil. Karama piped up. What for? Naruto asked. You need to make a list of things you need to buy, since you are going to be living here from now on and you don't have caretakers anymore, Karama stated. Toilet paper, toothbrush, blankets, pots and pans, cooking utensils, clothes that won't get you killed. Wait, Naruto interrupted. Go back to that last part. What's wrong with my clothes? Are shinobi supposed to be stealthy? Karama asked, sounding bored. Well of course dummy. Naruto answered. And what part of the color orange screams stealth? Karama demanded. Whatever, orange will the be the last things the bad guys see before they fall over. Naruto said confidently. With laughter. Karama tacked on. Naruto gritted his teeth. The fox had a point. Naruto liked orange because it attracted attention, but a real shinobi isn't in the business of attracting attention unless he or she wanted to. Those who did had spectacularly short careers. Fine. You made your point. Naruto conceded reluctantly. Naruto could feel a faint sense of satisfaction come from within, but ignored it. You need to ask the Hokage to set you up with a bank account by the way. You don't have any money to your name, and for now you are just going to have to get by on his good graces. Naruto frowned slightly. Though he was only four, Naruto had his pride and didn't really like handouts, completely ignoring the fact he is already staying at a nice apartment on Saratobi's expense. He told Karama as much. If you want, we can save some of the allowance money and invest it. You can pay the old man back several times over by the time he retires. Karama suggested. That was a good idea. If he can make money for the old man, then it's not really a handout, it would be more like the old man is making a long time investment in him. You should probably ask him for a library card and maybe find out if there is a private place you can go to train. Oh, we need to check. Naruto hurriedly located a pencil and paper on the nightstand next to the bed and started scribbling furiously as Karama rattled off the things they will be needing. They had work to do. Naruto skipped down the stone-paved street in the market district beneath the orange-colored evening skies. Saratobi and Tuanbu followed close behind. Market district hadn't changed much since Kanoha's founding, it was consistently packed with tourists and villagers looking to shop and dine, especially at dinner time. Hey Naruto. Do you know where you are going? Saratobi called out from behind. I sure do. 
he twisted his body and flashed the Hokage a quick thumbs up. Is there a reason why you lied just now? Kurama asked. I'm not blind Kurama. I can feel the gazes of those restaurant owners. They would probably spit in my food while I'm not looking. And while I don't really care I can't take the risk of them doing the same to the old man. Naruto answered. So I gotta find a restaurant that doesn't hate me. Ha. Huh. I'll give you a hand then. All of a sudden Naruto felt his awareness multiply tenfold. Wah he put his hand to his head as he slowed to a walk. Too much information was coming in too fast. He could hear the loud conversations between drunk villagers. 99 bottles of sake on the wall 99 bottles of sake, take one down, pass it round. The nonsensical ramblings of gossiping grandmothers. You hear the latest gossip out of Kumo? So apparently. And the whispered insults of the restaurant owners and hostesses. It's that brat, I can't wait for him to come in here so I can. Naruto slowed his breathing to calm himself. He thought back to what Kurama told him about not giving any power to words and felt the insults drift around, through, and past him. A few seconds later he managed a smile and started skipping again. Kurama frowned on the inside. He had underestimated the resentment of the villagers towards Naruto, who was busy filtering out the insults and feeling the general intent behind the words. Shinobi or not, no four-year-old should be subject to this kind of mental abuse. Kurama was about to apologize to Naruto for giving him heightened senses when Naruto turned left into a smaller side street. There. Naruto said loudly as he pointed towards a wooden shop and ran to it. Kurama focused on the wooden two-story shop in front of them. He felt a distinct lack of malice as Naruto made his way to the shop. The shop had a large water tank on the roof and two gas canisters outside, it gave off a very mom-and-pop feel. Kurama spied the words on the shop as Naruto hopped onto one of the serving stools. Raymond Ichiraku huh? Well. I hope their food is good, it's been a while since I've had Raymond. Do specials. Naruto shouted as a smiling Suratobi took the empty seat next to the hyperactive four-year-old. Yosh. Came the enthusiastic response from the pair behind the counter. The server was a slender, pale-skinned girl with dark brown hair and black eyes. The main cook, whom Naruto assumed to be the proprietor, was a solidly built man with tan skin and dark gray hair. He had a slightly round face, with just a hint of wrinkles creeping in around the cheeks. Both wore white robes, the only difference was the cook had a small serving hat, while the girl wore a white bandana which held her hair back. Naruto watched the pair expertly go about their craft and was not disappointed as two fresh bowls of beef katsu ramen landed in front of Naruto and Suratobi in three minutes flat. Enjoy. The chef smiled warmly without any hint of hesitation at Naruto and Suratobi. It's safe to eat. Kurama told Naruto. I followed their movement the entire time. I did Akamasu. Naruto cheered loudly as he took a pair of chopsticks and bit into the beef katsu. It was glorious. Naruto had never tasted anything so good in his life. The lightly peppered flaky outer crust of the meat gave way easily to the soft tender core. Naruto took a bite of the noodles and drank a little bit of the broth. The noodles were firm, yet yielding, and the broth salted just enough to give it flavor, but not enough to overwhelm the noodles and the meat. Tears of joy ran down Naruto's cheeks. He was undergoing a religious experience. Why are you crying Naruto? Suratobi looked over in concern. It's oo good. This is the beat meal I've ever had. I'm worried I'll never be able to eat this again. Naruto wailed. The cook from behind the counter laughed heartily, don't you worry my young friend. As long as I have customers like you I will never stop cooking. Suratobi patted Naruto's head, you heard him. This place isn't going anywhere. Now eat your fill. Naruto nodded and started packing it away. Suratobi stared as Naruto finished his sixth bowl. Wow. That must be some kind of record. The cook said in amazement as he scratched his head. Woo. I'm stuffed. Naruto said as he finished off the broth and put the bowl on the counter. Thanks for a great meal old man. I'll be sure to come back tomorrow. The cook smiled. The name is Tuchi Kid. And this is my daughter Am. Am nodded with a smile. What's your name? Yuzumaki Naruto. Well now, you have a good evening, young Naruto. We'll see you back here tomorrow. Tuchi and Aami waved as Naruto and Suratobi got up to leave. Thanks for the meal, Tuchi-san and A.M. Ni-chan. Naruto waved back. When Suratobi dropped Naruto back off at the apartment, Naruto gave him another hug. Thanks for the meal old man. Don't mention it. Suratobi muttered, really, don't remind me again. His wallet was a lot lighter now. Say Jiji, Naruto began with a twinkle in his eye, do you think you can help me out with some things? Suratobi did not particularly care for Naruto's scheming expression, what do things do you need help with? He asked cautiously. Naruto took out a list out of his pocket and put on some reading glasses. Wait, where did he get those glasses? Oh nothing that's too troubling for a Hokage I'd imagine. Just a bank account since I'm not old enough to set one up, maybe some easy missions that I can do to help pay for things, a library card, maybe a private training area. Suratobi put one hand over his face as Naruto went down the list one item at a time. 
What did I get myself into? Naruto found himself sitting in the mindscape back at the edge of the lake. The moon hung brightly above the hill and provided subdued illumination. Hey Naruto. Kurama materialized out of the grass in front of him. Hey Kurama. Are we going to train some more? Yes. I wanted to apologize first thought for raising your awareness like that. I shouldn't have done that without asking you first. Kurama said remorsefully. Naruto understood the real meaning behind Kurama's words. Hey don't worry about it. I know you were just trying to help. Besides, it's like you said, words are just words. I'll let my actions speak for me. Kurama returned the grin, that's the spirit. As a reward I'll teach you a jutsu. Naruto pumped his arms up into the air. Yes. What am I learning? Kurama beckoned to Naruto and they sat down facing each other. Now pay attention. Naruto leaned in close as Kurama began his explanation. Your very first jutsu is an ninjutsu called Henge. This technique allows the user to transform into any shape or person by using chakra. The hand signs are dog, boar, and ram in sequence. Kurama used four of his tails and manipulated Naruto's fingers to each shape. Go through those signs in sequence while I talk. Naruto obediently began forming the hand seal sequence repeatedly. This technique is used primarily for gathering information, as it allows the user to blend in with their surroundings. The key to this technique is creativity and experience. If you are just transforming into a random person, then the only thing you have to worry about is creating a consistent persona for that person. If you want to transform into someone everyone will recognize, like the Hokage, for instance, then you need to emulate every aspect of his behavior. The success of your transformation depends largely on your skill in awareness and observation. Karama continued as Naruto nodded. Takra usage for this technique will vary depending on your transformation target. Transforming into something that is similar to your shape and mass won't take much effort. Transforming into something small like a shoe or something large like a house will take a large amount of chakra. One of the drawbacks of this technique is that it will drain your chakra constantly to maintain the form, and any sort of physical contact and exertion will increase that drain. Naruto considered this information carefully. Thanks to your Yuzumaki blood, you have enough chakra to maintain a similar sized henge for about 8 hours, 2 to 4, if you are going to perform any sort of physical activities. Okay let's give it a try. Naruto stood up as Kurama coached him, visualize what you want to become now hold that image in your head focus the chakra into your hands and go through the seals, when you finish the seals push the chakra out of your hand while still holding the image in your mind. Naruto went through the seals fairly quickly and visualized the old man as he exhaled and pushed the chakra out of his body. White smoke enveloped him as he felt the chakra coursing through his system, coating his skin, subtly altering his shape and stretching his body out. It felt slightly uncomfortable and awkward, but there was no pain. Naruto opened his eyes as the smoke dissipated. Well? He asked. Only it was not his voice, it was the tired voice of a wise leader long past his prime. Kurama got up from where he was sitting and circled Suratobi Naruto. He nodded positively. Every detail was spot on, from the white robes to the red kimono underneath, to the age spots that dotted his face. Naruto even had wood striping pattern on the tobacco pipe down exactly. Very good Naruto, release the technique. Naruto released the chakra coating him and felt the chakra dissipate out of his skin in another cloud of smoke. As the smoke settled he felt himself back in his normal shape. That is a very good impression, but let's up the ante by transforming into something different. What do you have in mind? Kurama grinned as the ground beside Naruto cracked open slightly and a line of metallic white filing cabinet rose up out of the ground. Kurama walked to the eighth cabinet and pulled open the second door with his tail. He stood on his hind legs and pulled out a series of manila folders and walked back to Naruto as the cabinets retreated back underground. And these folders are a series of profiles. Select one of these profiles to be your alter ego. Kurama informed him. Why do I need an alter ego? Naruto asked as Kurama handed him the folders and they both sat back down. To level the playing field. Kurama responded, we still have a long ways to go before the villagers will change their mind about you. Using this alter ego will allow you to buy things without worrying about quality or price. I dunno that seems kind of like cheating. Naruto turned his nose up with his eyes closed. Heh, not even if it saves the old man money in the long run. If Naruto was one weakness Kurama could exploit, it was his fondness for the old man. Naruto still looked skeptical. Look, I'll prove it to you tomorrow. But just go along with it for now. Though still skeptical, Naruto figured he might as well put in his best effort since this was his first jutsu. Don't people recognize some of these profiles, Naruto asked as he opened the first folder. Nope. Most of these profiles were people I met a long time ago, outside of the elemental Nishansi seriously doubt anyone here knows who they are. Naruto read the first profile. Name. Super Sonico. Age. 18. Occupation. Model singer musician artist. Description. A talented girl with Musi. What kind of name is Super Sonico? 
Burrito glanced over at the attached portrait. Pink hair. Really. The girl was cute no doubt, but her attractiveness build in pink hair would attract the wrong sort of attention. Naruto discarded the folder into a new pile. On to profile number 2. Name. Hatsune Miku. Age. 16. Occupation. Model singer. Description. A gifted sing. The name passes, but why is her hair turquoise? Naruto thought as he glanced at her photo. Wait a second. Naruto tossed the Miku folder into a new maybe pile and rifled through the rest of the profile folders quickly. Hey Kurama. How come all of these profiles are teenage girls? Naruto complained loudly. Kurama stared at him as if he had just asked the most ridiculous question in the world because most shopkeepers are men and they only have enough blood to power one of two organs. Naruto raised his eyebrows. Which two organs? I'll tell you when you get old. Look, just trust me on this okay? Thinii. Naruto picked the profiles back up. Profile number 3. 30 minutes later, Naruto settled on profile number 2. Hirama nodded his approval. Okay, whenever you are ready. Naruto disappeared in a puff of smoke. Hirama stared at the three-foot cardboard cutout of Hatsune Miku. He buried his face into his paws. Naruto changed back, okay, that was wrong. He smiled sheepishly. Visualize Wats in the photo, not the photo. Kurama growled from between his paws. Yay 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 stupid hero Kitsune. Naruto muttered. He put his hands together and ran through the seals again. Chapter 5. The Fall of Root. Naruto was giving his long shopping list a last look over on the sofa when a knock sounded on the kitchen window. Naruto looked up and saw a familiar mask silver-haired Anbu perched outside on the small railing. The Anbu waved to him as Naruto got up and opened the window. Oh hi yo Mr. Dog. What brings you around? Naruto greeted cheerfully. Hey Naruto. Hokajama asked me to drop this off for you. Dog slid a brown envelope out of his flak jacket and handed it to Naruto. It's most of the things you asked for last night, though there are still a couple of items that's still waiting for the paper rock to catch up. Naruto took the envelope and opened it up. There was a thousand ryo, a shiny new bank card accompanied by a green account book and a library card with his name stamped on. Naruto and Kurama were both suitably impressed. Wow, the old man sure works fast. Naruto exclaimed. Dog shrugged, you learn to be efficient when you face a mountain of paperwork every day. Naruto blanched, as does he really have that much paperwork every day. Add in more, sometimes he doesn't even have enough time to get through all of them. I don't envy him in the least bit. Dog admitted to Naruto's horror. Well, I better get going. John and Naruto. Dog back flipped off the railing and bounded back towards the tower. Thanks Mr. Dog. See you around. Naruto leaned out the window and waved after him. Having second thoughts. Kurama asked him musingly as Naruto had a horrible vision of himself been suffocated underneath a pile of paperwork. Just wait and see. I'll find a way to conquer paperwork. Big words for a tiny kid. Kurama laughed. Kurama's tone turned serious. Before we leave, can you open up the seal slightly? Naruto's eyes widened. It functions in the real world too. Wait, why do you need me to open up the seal? To answer your first question, yes it works in the real world too. However, it functions differently out here. Opening the seal out here will determine how much of my power can manifest in this world. For example, if you open the seal all the way I would be able to manifest completely in the real world. No matter how much of the seal you open up however, I will still be bound to you and will be unable to harm you. Oh. And to answer your second question. I want you to open the seal up slightly because I need to get in contacts with my agents like I told you previously. Staying updated on the latest politics and the economy is the key to a successful cage, and by extension, the village. Naruto didn't fully understand Kurama's explanation, but he could sense no ill will from his tenant. Won't people be able to sense your chakra? I doubt it. The only time in the people in the village sensed my chakra was when I was manipulated by the Sharingan. The small amount of chakra that I plan on using will be devoid of any malice or rage and is comparable to a genin using a classy jutsu. And don't worry about not understanding the explanation. You will understand once you are older. How do I open up the seal? Is it like what I did in the mindscape? Exactly like it. Naruto grinned as he channeled a small amount of chakra on his right palm and placed it over the back of his left hand. A small green translucent circle appeared and Naruto turned it slickly. Perfect. Now hold out your right palm. Naruto complied and watched in fascination as orange chakra oozed out of his palm. The bubble rose up slightly and coalesced into a small four-legged creature. Naruto found himself staring at a palm-sized fox. The fox winked at him before turning around and hopping off his palm onto the railings. Naruto leaned out the window and caught a glimpse of the fox loping across the rooftops and splitting multiple times. The leash of foxes each peeled off in different directions as they clambered up the walls and disappeared into the forest beyond. That is so cool. Hirama smiled. He should get updates and reports from his proxies and agents within a month, two at most. But for now though they had a shopping list to attend to. Come on kit. 
It's high time we get going. This shopping list isn't going to fill itself. Naruto picked up the crisp red apple. You said this was how much he asked incredulously. A skinny shopkeeper with black hair and dark brown skin sneered at him 50 Ryo. And that's because I'm giving you the special discount. If you don't like it get out of my shop. An apple wouldn't cost 50 Ryo, even if it was the last one in the land of fire. Karama fumed. Naruto put the apple back down. He shoved his hands into his black cargo shorts and walked out dejectedly out of the store with his head down. He heard the laughter behind him. Ha. Special discount. You got him good boss. The same scenario played out when Naruto went to look at the weapons shop and the clothing store. This really sucks. How am I going to pay the old man back if I'm going to get ripped off left and right everywhere I go? Naruto complained to Kurama as he walked down the street. Duck in that alley. Kurama commanded. Naruto obeyed. Once he was in the alleyway he folded his arms against his white t-shirt. Now what? I think it's time to give your first jutsu a try don't you think? Naruto nodded. I guess it wouldn't hurt to try. Let's see if it really makes a difference. Naruto ran quickly through the hand seals and disappeared in a cloud of white smoke. The dashi can tapped his fingers on the counter mindlessly at 2 in the afternoon. His three male employees were busy restocking the shelves with fruit and vegetables while chattering among themselves. Rush hour was over and they no longer had to keep up appearances for customers. Han looked over his record books while wearing a faint smile. Driving out the demon brat earlier sure felt good, looks like it's going to be another slow afternoon. As soon as he thought that, the shop entrance opened up and the service bell rang. Iris Amos. The four men called out automatically. The girl with turquoise hair wearing a kimono stepped cautiously into Ken's store. Utter silence descended as the male employees caught sight of the girl and turned to stare. The slender 16-year-old perfection had long turquoise hair that reached down to her knees, despite the fact it was pinned up into two ponytails by red ribbons. She had a pale round face with large green eyes set between a narrow pointed nose above a small mouth. Her soft pink kimono was adorned with red and white sakura flowers. Her soft glossy lips curved into a gentle smile as collective hearts of the male employees skipped a beat. She bowed slightly. Hanachua. My name is Hatsun Miku, and I have only recently moved into town. I was hoping one of you gentlemen would be able to help me with my grocery shopping today. Her melodious voice sang out invitingly as she straightened from her bow. The three workers looked at each other before pandemonium broke out as they fought and stumbled over each other to be the girl's gentlemen. Wait, I'll hell. Do. Who? Pick me. Pick. A series of wet whacks sounded, and the three men fell face first into the ground in unconscious heaps. Hen stepped over his employees and set the nail covered bat down against the counter. He cleared his throat, held out his arm. I would be delighted to help you, Miku chan. Miku giggled and wrapped her arm around his. Tadashi felt an electric thrill run up his spine as she pressed against him, and he looked down at her large green eyes. Thank you. Forgive me. What is your name? Tadashi Ken. Thank you, Ken Kun. She smiled warmly as she squeezed his arm. Why why don't you show me your list and we'll get what you need. Tadashi stammered as they stepped over the unconscious heaps on the ground. Ken bagged the last of the groceries nervously while Miku-chan watched him with a smile. Everything had to be perfect for his goddess. He even slipped in the brand new ginger root snacks from Whirlpool Country. How much is it? She asked delicately as she took out a brown envelope. Quick. Flutter your eyes at him. How the heck do I do that? Dust blinked rapidly. Miku-chan smiled and fluttered her eyes at Ken when he looked up. Oh, there will be no no charge. Ken struggled to find the words. He was dangerously close to losing himself in Miku-chan's eyes, consider it a welcome to Kanoha gift. Seal the deal kit, give him a reward. I am not kissing him. That's a weapon of last resort. Let him cop a feel. Ugh. Fine. Really thank you so much. Miku-chan grabbed Ken's hand and pressed it slightly again her chest. Ken's mouth formed into a small circle, oh ho. He stuttered as spray of blood blew out his nose onto the countertop and his eyes rolled back. The man swayed back and forth before joining the employees he betrayed. Flawless victory. Miku-chan stuck her tongue out at the unconscious perverts and swiped the bag groceries off the counter. Remember, most males are vulnerable to this kind of manipulation, though they typically focus on the physical attributes first. Female aren't immune either, though they can be more picky in regards to personality types. The voice inside Miku-chan coached as she strolled out the front door. Similar scenes of devastation would be repeated at the Ryu's weapon shop, Sasuke's general store, and Daiki's clothier. Naruto hung up the last of the shirts his older sister Miku-chan bought for him and slid the closet door closed. He was extremely happy at all the free stuff he got. Naruto picked up the list and crossed out the last item. Because he was an orphan, Naruto treasured everything he had and took none of it for granted. He kept a meticulous inventory of every single object inside his apartment. 
Though Naruto had really wanted to pay for his new possession fair and square, Kurama said this to him, consider it a lesson to them for making decisions based on appearances. You should take this lesson to heart, lest you find yourself underestimating a powerful foe. Naruto could not argue against that, though he still feels slightly guilty. He walked over to the kitchen and started to fold the empty grocery bags so he could reuse them later. Waste not, want not. These were good habits to have. Naruto felt a lump inside one of the bags and unfolded it. He pulled out a yellow plastic pack and stared. Ginger root surprise. The pack read. It had anthropomorphic ginger wearing sunglasses giving a thumbs up. Naruto frowned. He wasn't a big fan of ginger and certainly not surprises. How did this get in here? The Iro grocer slipped it in to get into Miku's good graces. Really? That's pathetic. I hope I don't end up like that Iro. Don't worry, you will. What? It's just a fact of life. I do hope you develop better tactics than he does though. What? Do we really need to have the talk right now? No, no, I'll pass for now. Just as I thought. Anyway, if you think it's going to taste bad, why not share it with someone? Misery loves company after all. Good idea. Naruto could count the number of people he would be willing to share the snack with on one hand, so it was a fairly easy decision. Naruto left his apartment and made his way toward the Hokage Tower. Garrison Saratobi sat in his office. Two piles of paper occupied his large rounded oak desk. Saratobi sighed as he took a piece of paper from the left pile, skimmed and scribbled his signature on it before moving it to the right stack. A knock sounded on his office door. Come. Saratobi looked up to see the door creaked open and a heavily bandaged man dressed in a black and white kimono shuffling in. Ah, Danzo, welcome. Have a seat. Saratobi beckoned at the counselor as he pulled out another piece of paper from the left pile and looked back down. Thanks, Saratobi. Danzo said as he slipped into the chair in front of Saratobi's desk. What can I do for you today? Saratobi asked as he scribbled on the paper in front of him, ignoring the lack of formality from his counselor. Nothing. I just wanted to let you know our guests at the friendship camp have learned the errors of their ways. They won't be spilling any more S-class secrets ever. Saratobi suppressed a smile at Danzo's nickname for torture and interrogation. He raised his eyebrows and paused mid-scribble to ponder Danzo's last statement though. You didn't kill them, did you? He asked. No of course not. Danzo snapped, seemingly insulted. He was insulted. I placed seals on their tongues which will cause them to black out if they try to speak or write about the events of the other night. Saratobi stroked his chin and pulled out his pipe. That's a good solution. Good work. Did you learn anything of value? Was there any sort of foreign power at work? Saratobi asked as he lit his pipe. Anzo shook his head, no. It looks like the fools just had one too many cups of liquid courage. Saratobi shook his head and puffed his pipe. Danzo was used to seeing daggers behind every shadow and known for his thoroughness, if his paranoia was satisfied, then Saratobi will leave it at that. Thank you for the report Danzo. You may go now. Saratobi took another puff of his pipe, set it down, and resumed working on the paperwork. Danzo stood and nodded at Saratobi before turning and marching out of the office. As the door clicked shut, a young voice came from Saratobi's right side. Hey old man, I didn't know Kanoha had a friendship camp. Young Naruto poked his head in through one of the windows. Naruto. Get down from there. Saratobi yelled at him and stood up, a windowsill was no place for a four-year-old. Okie dokie. Saratobi looked on in amazement as the Naruto's head disappeared from view before he cartwheeled through window and landed on his feet. How did you get up here? Saratobi demanded. The lady at the door was a meanie, so I used the fire escape. The kid said with laughter. Oh. Okay. At least he wasn't doing anything stupidly dangerous, like walking up walls. Did you hear the whole conversation? Yep. What's liquid courage? Naruto asked. Nothing you need to know about. Listen Naruto, forget about everything you heard just now okay? Saratobi ordered. Naruto shrugged, if you say so old man. But that other guy smelled funny. Saratobi sighed. He was feeling his age all too often these days, especially around the hyperactive four-year-old who had extremely short attention spans. So what brings you here today Naruto? Saratobi redirected. Oh. That's right. Someone accidentally gave me a pack of these ginger surprise snacks. I wanted to see if you want to try them out with me. You know, as thanks for helping me out. The young man grinned and held out pack of snacks. That's nice of you. Saratobi nodded in approval. Ah. That reminds me. I forgot to give these to Danzo as a token of my appreciation for his hard work. Saratobi slapped his forehead as he pulled out a large straw basket filled to the brim with various fruit from underneath his desk. There were apples, bananas, strawberries, grapes, mangoes, and a couple of other fruits Naruto didn't recognize, but smelled sweet. Saratobi thought of something, say Naruto, can you do something for me? Saratobi asked. Sure Jiji. What's up? Naruto said enthusiastically. Can you take this basket of fruit and give it to the Danzo? 
He was the person I was talking to before you came in. Naruto frowned slightly. This seemed like a chore. Saratobi correctly read the boy's expression and rephrased, alas, if you are not interested, I fear I will have to make it a mission for some other shinobi hopeful. A mission you say? Naruto leaned forward, his interest peaked. Exactly, a mission. Saratobi nodded Lee slowly. He needed to make up some bogus condition so it would appear more mission-like. Oh, there's an idea. One of the conditions for this mission is that you can't let anyone see you giving him the fruit basket. You must report back to me when you deliver the package, dismissed. Saratobi said in the same authoritative tone he reserved for the Anbu. Hi. Hokajama. A split second and a yellow blur later, both Naruto and the fruit basket vanished from Saratobi's office. Hok, line, sinker. The third Hokage smiled triumphantly, and his gaze drifted over to the snack sitting on the corner of his desk. The ginger man with sunglasses stared back at him with a thumbs up. I'll eat it when he gets back. Saratobi told himself as he eyed it suspiciously. Misery loves company after all. As he reached for another piece of paper on the left pile though, a nagging question hung over the back of his mind. When did we get a fire escape? Naruto sprinted down the cobblestone street with fruit basket in hand, hot on the Danzo's trail. Though Saratobi had not told him where to go, Naruto was sure he could track Danzo down by smell alone, and figured the lack of information was part of the challenge. After all, not every mission specified the location of the target. Hirama agreed to go along with it because it was getting late and he hadn't finished planning out Naruto's training. Thanks for letting me use your nose. Naruto thought. You're welcome. Kurama shrugged, he hadn't actually enhanced Naruto's sense of smell. Perhaps it's an unintentional side effect of sealing me into him at such a young age. Kurama thought to himself. Naruto stopped in the middle of the street intersection and sniffed the air, ignoring the curious looks of passing villagers. He followed the faint smell of bandages down the street and into an alleyway between two wooden houses. Naruto stepped into the alleyway and looked around in in surprise. There was a red brick wall between the houses in front of him, it was a dead end. How odd I'm sure I followed the scent correctly, but it disappears into the wall. Hirama piped up. Observe your surroundings closely Naruto. Look for inconsistencies. Naruto scanned his surroundings. An alleyway with a dead end was nothing new. The difference in the construction material, however, merited a closer look. Naruto disregarded the wooden walls, they were the same material and color as the rest of the houses they belonged to. Naruto stood in front of the brick wall and studied it closely. Halfway up the wall a slightly lighter brick jutted out slightly. Bingo. Naruto ran his hand against the brick, then pushed against it when he felt it gave way under the pressure. The brick retracted silently into the wall, and a faint rectangular outline appeared on the wall. The faint outline solidified into dark lines as the rectangular door slid backwards and to the side with a slight groan. Naruto peered into the darkness in wonder. This is so cool. Naruto thought excitedly. Hirama was slightly worried. He had seen enough of Konoha to know that this tunnel was something out of the ordinary. It was impossible for this to be a simple utility tunnel, they were generally well lit, carefully marked, and did not feature hidden entrances, unless Konoha's civil engineering team sources was trying to emulate Iowa. No, someone had gone out of their way to create this secret base in the heart of a hidden village right under the noses of watchful shinobi. Whoever this person was very rich, very powerful, and definitely very cunning. Or just insanely stupid. Be careful Naruto. Kurama warned as Naruto stepped into the darkness without any hint of fear. Danzo walked quickly in the unlit tunnels underneath Konoha. He knew Root headquarters like the back of his hand and had made it a policy so that most of the facility remained perpetually in the darkness, mostly so that his fledgling organization could be easily defended in the event of an invasion. His newly recruited Anbu operatives however, complained loudly and openly about been literally kept in the dark all the time whenever they thought Danzo wasn't listening. Amateurs? Danzo sneered. No wonder Konoha was stagnating. The Shinobi Corporation was filled to the brim with useless whiny meat bags. When the newest crop of root child soldiers finally graduated, he would dispose of these worthless Anbu and shore up the organization's remaining weaknesses. But for now, he'll make do with what he had. Yes, he was the true fire shadow. He will be at the forefront of whatever it took to make a Konoha a stronger, better place. And he will not be stopped. Naruto moved cautiously and quietly, with one hand braced against the wall in the blinding darkness. Whoever lives here probably doesn't like light or loud noises, so I should be polite and stay quiet as well. Naruto reasoned as he crept along. I don't like this. Kurama muttered. Don't be such a scaredy cat. We'll just find Danzo's home, drop off the package, and be back in time for some ramen. Kurama ignored Naruto's taunt with a huff and reached out with his enhanced senses to watch for danger. A minute later Naruto's hand ran against something round and metallic. Hey, there's a doorknob here. He opened the door slightly and peered in before Kurama could warn him about opening random doors. It was a tiny room bordered on all sides by grey stone. 
a small rolled-up futon was propped against the corner wall next to a miniature wood desk and chair. The room was illuminated by a small candle, and Naruto could make out a small boy roughly the same size as him dressed in complete black, sitting with his back to the door. With a mischievous smile, Naruto crept up silently next to the boy and whispered boo. The boy fell out of his chair in fright but calmed after a few seconds. Naruto studied the boy in front of him. He had extremely pale skin with short black hair and sported a round face with a slightly pointed chin. He had been drawing with a brush on a scroll before Naruto scared him. Wow. How very mature of you. Kurama stated deadpan. Naruto ignored the barb and laughed as he stuck out his hand, sorry if I scared you. I couldn't resist. My name is Naruto, what's yours? The pale boy's black eyes narrowed at Naruto and and tilted his head. Anzo-sama calls me Sai sometimes. Said the boy as he took Naruto's hand and shook it. Well, Sai sometimes, what are you doing here? Do you live here? Is this a secret club or something? Naruto peppered Sai with questions as he stuck his hands behind his head. The boy's face turned even more pale at Naruto's questions and crouched into a bowl with his fists next to his ears. The first rule of Root is you do not talk about Root. Sai muttered repeatedly as he huddled in a little bowl while rocking back and forth on his feet, his eyes staring into the distance. Uh what? Naruto stared as Sai kept rocking back and forth in a little bowl on the floor. Naruto wisely backed out of the room and closed the door in front of him. What was that? Hirama had a pretty good idea, the boy called Sai, displayed telltale signs of memory alteration and possibly hypnotic suggestion. Maybe it's just a personality quirk. Kurama offered, hoping to quickly redirect Naruto's attention, what do you think of the name Root? That's a dumb name for a secret club. I can come up with something better. Like what? Kurama was genuinely curious. Naruto scrounged up his face in concentration. Kanoha Super Beast Sentai. He stated finally after a minute of thinking. Uncomfortable silence hung over Naruto as Kurama rolled his eyes. Let's just drop off the fruit basket okay? The Kurama's great annoyance, Naruto stopped several more times to peek into the various doors that he came across, though he exercised more caution and did not disturb any of the inhabitants. The sound of conversation in an open room that branched off from the main corridor caused Naruto to slow his steps and creep towards the source. Naruto leaned his ear out slightly to hear the conversation better. Hino still has trouble controlling his wood abilities. In fact the other day he sprouted a branch right out of his thigh during sparring practice. I've got so many wood jokes lined up he will never live it down, laughter. Wood jokes. I didn't know you can make up jokes about wood. Ignore them. Kurama instructed. Still too young for an explanation. In the meantime, Kurama was having an internal monologue with himself. But another Mokuten user. Interesting. Perhaps an illegitimate child of Hashirama's. Kurama doubted that. None of Hashirama's offspring were able to replicate his feats of wood release, and Hashirama hadn't been the type to sow his seed in multiple fields, Mito would have seen him dead for that. Hirama snickered at his own horticulture-related jokes. Naruto tiptoed past the open room and continued down the corridor. As he reached the end of the corridor, his outstretched hand encountered a solid metal door. A faint light on the wall blinked twice as the door slid open with a soft hiss. Tired of fumbling in the dark, Naruto looked for a light source. Another blinking red light on the far left side of the room he entered drew him over as the door behind him closed silently. I wonder what this does. Naruto thought as he stood in front of the light. He didn't recognize any of the characters next to the buttons. Kurama did, but was a step too slow as Naruto reached up towards the illuminated button. Wait, don't touch any, Kurama shouted as Naruto jammed his finger on the purge all button. Silence. Kurama sighed in relief. Oh I didn't do anything. Naruto was disappointed. Maybe I'm doing it wrong. Naruto did the only logical thing he could think of. He hammered the button repeatedly. Naruto was momentarily blinded as a series of ceiling lanterns bathed the room in blinding light, and a klaxon began to ring loudly. While Naruto froze momentarily as the sudden light blinded him momentarily, and he covered his eyes with his arm. Naruto lowered his arm a few seconds later as his eyes adjusted to the light. He froze as faint shouts and sounds of pounding reverberated through the metal door he had came through. There, on the other side. Run. Kurama shouted at him. Naruto saw a second set of large metal doors that was slowly sliding to a close on the opposite side of the room. He ran. Naruto didn't have a chance to make sense of the transparent cylindrical glass vats or the things it held as he ran past. The vats had semi-spherical metal tops connected by a series of cables leading into the ceiling. The first jar Naruto ran by had a set of lavender eyes. The second had a wrinkled arm implanted with red eyes. The third held a hand that was divided down the middle, half was flash, the other half was wood. Naruto managed to dive and roll through the gap at the last second. He braced his feet against the ground and sprang forward into a run. Nice moves, Kit. Meanwhile the Anbu trapped on the other side of the door finally breached the room. They reached the flashing control panel just in time to see the safety protocols kicked in and the sterilization seals activate. 
They watched in morbid curiosity as high-voltage electricity coursed through the jars and destroyed all trace of organic matter. By the time the lightning seals exhausted their store chakra, only unrecognizable lumps of carbon were left floating in the jars. Naruto cursed and flattened himself against the wall as a group of people ran past him in the dark. What the hell's going on in the lab? A voice shouted as they ran towards the fading klaxon behind Naruto. I don't know. You know as well as I do I can't see a blasted thing in this a second voice cut off before they rounded the corner. Naruto let out his breath and resumed his walk down the tunnel. He was going to get in big trouble with the old man if anyone caught him now. He caught the smell of bandages again and followed with his nose. He came to an intersection and peeked around the corner. Naruto made out two faint silhouettes in the darkness guarding a rectangular wooden door. The smell came from behind that door. That must be where he is, but I can't let them see me giving old man Danzo the fruit basket or else I'm going to fail the mission. What can we do to distract them? Any ideas Kurama? No if we had time to find the layout of the place and more information we might have more options, but as it is you have no chance of getting past those guards. And I just use Henge. You could try, but you will most likely get caught. Henge typically doesn't work on Jonin level shinobi. As Naruto racked his brain for ideas, a shinobi ran past Naruto from behind him and started shouting. Danzo-sama. Danzo-sama. Someone has activated the sterilization procedures in the lab. The door to the office burst open and the bandaged old man limped out in a hurry, his face ugly with anger. What? Show me. He roared. The terrified shinobi led a very angry Danzo and his two guards past Naruto. None of the man noticed the blonde Jinchiriki flattened against the wall in their haste. Score. Naruto cheered inside as he scampered forward and ducked into Danzo's office. I really need some decorating tips. Naruto announced as he surveyed the room. Much like Sai's room, the office was very boring. The featureless room held a large wooden desk and chair, seemingly identical to the ones found in the Hokage office in the middle. Behind the desk was a large bookshelf which occupied the entire back wall. Rows of wooden cabinets and drawers lay flush against the left and right walls of the room. He seems to be in a rush, should I wait for him? Naruto pondered he looks pretty angry though, just leave it on his desk so we can get out of here. Kurama advised. Since he works here, he'll be sure to see the package sooner or later. Naruto sighed and walked over to the desk and set the basket down. As he did so however, the basket knocked over the reading candle and the ink pot that had been on the desk. Both objects fell to the ground with a clatter as a horrified Naruto looked on. The reading candle extinguished upon hitting the ground but miraculously did not break part. The ink pot was not as lucky, it broke into several large pieces and a thousand tiny silvers. The oily ink splattered everywhere and left an unbroken trail of flammable material between the candle and bookcase. Oops. Naruto laughed nervously. Hirama sighed. Please be careful kid. There's no point in info. Hey what's that? Naruto's hyperactive attention jumped to a shiny white object sitting on the bookshelf. He picked up the object gently and ran his fingers down the front. It was a white porcelain fox mask with vibrant red markings. That's good craftsmanship. Kurama admitted. Hey, did you hear something? A voice came from outside the room. Crap. Naruto stuffed the oversized mask down his shirt and ducked underneath the table. He saw two pairs of feet walk past and around the desk. Crap 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 crap. Whoa. One of the voices cried out. Naruto heard a thud as something heavy hit the ground. The second voice hurried over hey, you okay? Come on, talk to me. Yeah I'm fine. Just bruised my pride is all. Come on, let's go find Danzo-sama. The first voice muttered as his compatriot laughed and helped him up. Naruto heard the shuffling of feet and peeked his head out from beneath the desk. Alone again. Naruto let out a sigh of relief. Let's get out of here. About time. Remember to stay on your guard, a lot of shinobis lose their lives when they think the battle is over and they let their guard down. Kurama lectured. I dot Naruto said mockingly as he slipped back out of room. With Kurama's advice at the forefront of his mind, Naruto carefully retraced his steps without attracting any attention. Luckily, Danzo and the rest of the shinobi in the lab were too focused on trying to salvage what they could from the glass vats to notice the blonde kid skirting the edge of the room. Ten minutes later Naruto jogged out of the dark tunnels with a smile on his face into the hazy afternoon sun. He rounded the corner out of the alley and promptly collided with a teenage boy and fell backwards. Hey kid, sorry about that. The older boy apologized and offered his hand to help Naruto up. Nah, don't be sorry, it wasn't your fault. I shouldn't run around corners like that. Naruto laughed at his own clumsiness as he took the offered hand and hoisted himself up. Just be careful from now on ya. The black-haired shinobi ruffled his hair. Off you go. Naruto stuck his tongue out at the man and the serious-looking boy next to him before taking off. What an energetic brat. The older boy muttered in a half-smile as he watched Naruto vanish into the crowds on the street. Did you say something Shisui-san? The younger boy asked next to him. 
Nah, don't worry about, Itachi-kun. Let's go get something to eat before we go see Danzo-sama. My treat. Shisui offered. Can we pick up some tomatoes for Sasu-kun as well? The younger boy asked. Sure, sure. Whatever you want. Shisui laughed as he led Itachi towards the grocer. About 30 seconds after Naruto left Danzo's office, the candle that fell on the ground began smoldering. The vanilla-scented Everlast candle was a very rare and very expensive, it lasted 10 times as long as a normal candle and could not be snuffed out unless a bit of chakra was applied to the wax base. A second later the candle snapped back to life. The special oil base disappearing ink Danzo used for his secret communiques quickly caught fire. A few moments later, the fire leaped onto the bookcase and hopped onto the surrounding cabinets and drawers. Danzo stared at the charred remains of his office. With the exception of his desk and chair in the middle of the room, everything had been burned to a crisp. His shinobi had put out the fire with a simple water jutsu, but no jutsu could undo the damage that was done. All of the confidential shinobi profiles from across the elemental nations, all of the secret treaties with foreign agents and rulers, all of the financial reports and payment information, all of the data from the questionable biological experiments, all of the secret missions and potential assassination targets. All of it gone. Ashes in the wind. Everything except a table, a chair and a fruit basket. Anzo's eyes stared at basket of fruit sitting on his desk. He flicked his hand and one of the anbu appeared in front of the basket. The Anbu rifled through the basket quickly and removed something. He turned around and handed a small scroll to Danzo. Danzo snatched the scroll with a growl and undid the seal. He opened the scroll and began to read. Dear Danzo Shimura, I must thank you from the bottom of my heart for going out of your way to ensure Yuzumaki Naruto's secret, even if the reasons for doing so were not entirely altruistic. I am aware that we have not really spoken in a while and that there are some things you feel I am better off knowing, but in truth I believe that whatever mistakes you have made in the dark can be forgiven and that it's not too late to come back to the light. We've had our differences in the past, but I hope we can set those differences aside and make Kanoha a better, safer place for the future. Your friend. Here is in Saratobi. Anzo stormed into the Hokage office in barely contained anger. Saratobi kept right on scribbling without looking up. Okajama, I Danzo began loudly. Ah Danzo. Did you find the fruit basket to your liking? Saratobi asked with a twinkle in his eye as he lifted his head and met Danzo's stare. As he be taunting me Danzo thought angrily. He inhaled laboriously and counted to ten. He was running on adrenaline right now and he needed to assess the situation calmly. Ah uh, yes. I did. Thank you very much. Danzo said quietly as Saratobi smiled. See. I told you I could do it. Danzo turned to stare at the source of the voice. He had been so angry he didn't even notice the blonde-haired brat perched on the windowsill chewing on some sort of snack. They are both chewing snacks. Danzo realized. Danzo spied the familiar fox mask peeking out from underneath Jinchuriki's shirt. Another wave of anger assault him as he realized who was responsible for the unmitigated disaster plaguing him. The you Danzo raised his arm and pointed as he stuttered. I I what? The brat looked at him in curious confusion. Danzo wanted to scream but could not continue. You destroyed all of my experiments containing highly questionable and unethically procured specimens. You stole from my base filled with kidnapped brainwashed children. You set fire to all of my records documenting all of Root's illegal activities and assassinations. Anzo dropped his arm, completely defeated. He couldn't make a single accusation without incriminating himself in the process. You have great potential as a shinobi. Danzo conceded to the brat's delight. Anzo's mind raced as he processed his available information. The scroll proved Saratobi's title of the professor wasn't just for show. He knew Danzo was assembling an alternate power structure behind his back. He knew Danzo was creating a secret army with stolen abilities. He knew everything and he had not destroyed Danzo outright. Danzo was beaten before he even began. Danzo snapped out of his thoughts as Saratobi spoke to Naruto, Naruto, these root snacks are pretty tasty, but the flavor wears out too fast. What do you think? Naruto nodded as he spat out a piece into the wastebiscuit and unwrapped another one. The flavor lasts for like a minute tops before it gets old and you have to get rid of it. But it's pretty good while it lasts eh? He said as he popped the fresh snack into his mouth. Danzo trembled at the mention of Root. That confirmed Danzo's paranoid suspicions. They knew everything and gave him a warning. Naruto's little incursion into Root headquarters was a demonstration of Saratobi's power. The Jinchuriki could have left to his base a smoking ruin filled piled high with bodies, but he had not done so. Instead, Saratobi must have ordered his puppet to destroy all of the documentation regarding Root, an effective tactic to cripple an organization without killing anyone. Without killing him. He is being merciful. To me. Of all people. Anzo knew what he had to do to placate Saratobi's wrath. He needed to shut everything down and clean up his mess, playtime was over. 
Danzo realized he had spent far too much time wallowing in his own sense of self-superiority and his ambitions to see that Siratobi was indeed a fine hokage. Now I see why Tabarama chose him to be the third. Danzo thought bitterly. I have no one to blame but myself. I am not fit to be the fire shadow. Kanoha's future is safe with him. I must thank you for your gift, Hokage-sama. I will not forget your magnanimity or your mercy. You can trust me to do the right thing. Danzo said as Hebo low. And he meant every word. Saratobi looked up in surprise, unaccustomed to this sort of formality or gift of words from Danzo. He smiled and nodded. You're most welcome Danzo. Dismissed. Danzo moved to the door, bowed again, and exited. Naruto and Saratobi shared a look of curiosity at the departing man before and shrugging and going back to what they were doing. A week later all traces of route disappeared from Kanoha. The tunnels and secret rooms became emergency escape routes and shelters that were added to the updated evacuation plans. The armory's weapon master received an anonymous tip-off and discovered a couple dozen crates of unused weapons and armor in an abandoned warehouse. The barracks received a long overdue shipment of beds, desks, and swivel chairs. Every single room was now properly furnished, and instances of honor duels over furniture no longer plagued the quartermaster. All of the Anbu who had been on vacation or had taken time off for various reasons, inexplicably returned to their duties all on the same day. For the first time since Kanoha's founding, there were more than enough shinobi to fulfill all of the existing contracts. There was also a sale in the market district for large glass vats. They became hot items, as many people found uses for them. A large number of them became aquariums, while some became trophy display cases, and others were appropriated as cooking apparatus, Tuchi bought two for Ichiraku Raymond. The Genin team led by Shisui Ichiha wiped out a camp of bandits and discovered all the children that had gone missing in the past year, hiding in a nearby cave, though the children had no memory of their abduction or how they ended up in the cave. Shisui and his team received commendations and were hailed as heroes, while all of the children were returned to their parents or were adopted. What if Naruto brother of Nido Yuzumaki? Thanks for watching my video till the end if you enjoy this content, then do consider subscribing to my channel and leave a like if you guys need the next part, comment down, and thanks for watching the video and see you guys in the next video.